A šta je izgubio konekciju, jel? Sound, sound check. So you can hear me well. Very good. Natasha. Yes. Please. Yeah. I mean, it's no, no. It's ten, ten o'clock. We should, we should get started. Please. I think. Good morning to everyone. I think we can get started. Uh, Secretary General of the RCC, Madame Bregu, Brigadier General, Mr. Folkstad, dear Andrea Carscone, join, joining us live from Rome, and dear Konstantin from Belgrade, welcome to the launching event of the Security Balkan Barometer Public Opinion Survey 2021. Security meter, perception of security threats in the Western Balkans. Uh, what makes this survey specific is not only that it has been commissioned for the first time in such scope and outreach, but also that it has been for the first time prepared through regional synergy and ownership together with our partners in, our, in, in the Western Balkans. And at this point, special gratitude goes to Rome, to our friends at the government of Italy especially the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who not only financially, but in all other possible means, supported this outstanding activity. As COVID-19 pandemic still prevents us from larger physical gathering, unfortunately, we have organized this event in hybrid mode with specially designed studio here in Sarajevo, and you can see part of the atmosphere here, and all other guests from around the world and Europe our panelists, distinguished speakers, connected via video link. Before passing the floor to distinguished keynote speakers, let me share with you a couple of technical information. Uh, this event is open for wider public, can be fo followed on Zoom platform, but of course at RCC social media channels, YouTube and Facebook live. Those of you who want uh, to use social media, please not forget to use hashtag securityMeter in quoting this event and reporting about it. Audience, and we have more than 200 people watching us live, uh, uh, will, be, will be also allowed to ask questions in written form, which will be visible to our moderator so that we can on time answer your curiosity and your questions. And after this intro panel, uh, there, there will be two more following. I will kindly ask you to stay with us as long as you can would be good if you can till the very end, because we will be have, having uh, some sort of the written conclusions um, and some summing up uh, part at the very end. So now, without any further ado, I'm inviting Madame Bregu to take the floor. Melinda, the floor is yours. Good morning to everybody. Uh, Amer, thank you for uh, reminding us as well uh, on all the technicalities it looks like uh, really strange to be to and to have a meeting physically although we are uh, really in a very small group of uh, people so dear friends colleagues partners dear eric andrea uh, and constantin today as you know is a special day for us it's a uh, a day that we are opening a new chapter in regional cooperation in the field of security by introducing to the wider public a tool which aspires to be of great usefulness and relevance for both institutions and citizens. 
The Regional Cooperation Council is presenting its first special edition of the Security Barometer Survey, Security Matter 2021, in cooperation with our partners CSAC, MARI, DPPI, and our IISG project. The Security Matter is a product of a hard work and coordinated efforts reflecting the voice of the people in the region in a number of crucial matters, ranging from terrorism, organized crime, border security to disaster prevention, hybrid threats and disinformation. Our all collective efforts have been further accentuated since the outbreak of this pandemic, at a time when serious deficiencies and regional security gaps came to surface. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed critical shortages in all aspects of our societies. This unprecedented situation has proven the importance of solidarity in times of crisis and the value of human life over politics and disputes. Security Matter, as I already said, is the first of its kind, although RCC always kept an eye on perceptions of security at regional level through our Balkan Barometer yearly editions. This time, the global pandemic, made it clear that security threats are not taking any time off. Now that many have shifted to working remotely and organizations are distracted trying to handle the virus, security and risk management need to be more vigilant than ever. The region finds it very important to work on addressing the security challenges in the Western Balkans, such as combating terrorism, fighting organized crime and strengthening border security, in order to ensure the internal security of the region. In this respect, the highest importance was given to addressing the challenges related to serious and organized crime from 82% of the citizens of the region, followed by work on combating terrorism, 88%, migrant crisis, 86%, and violent extremism and cybersecurity, 84%. It is quite interesting that 55% of those 82% who point out that organized crime is the main security threat, they say as well that is corruption, which fuels the existence of organized crime. Looking at the average for the Western Balkans, an overwhelming majority of the respondents, 70%, believe that the migrants entering the respondents' respective economy increase the security risk for their economy. Less than a third disagree with that sentiment. It is also notable that only 2% do not have or refuse to express their opinion, indicating that the question is a highly polarizing one, which almost all respondents having a clear stance on the issue are already taking uh, or, or expressing an opinion. On October 2018, the European Commission and representatives of Western Balkans 6 signed the Joint Action Plan on Counterterrorism for the Western Balkans. Today we notice with pleasure, then when asked on how law enforcement authorities are doing in fighting terrorism, 56% of Western Balkan citizens strongly support their actions. But when it comes to transnational organized crime, 48% are unsatisfied. In the study of geopolitics, it's like a rule that the first step is to determine the space under observation then examining the usual historic trajectory and geopolitical representatives that have a strong influence. In our region, some of the above mentioned use the historical context to justify extremist actions and the radicalization narratives. For 70% of the Western Balkan citizens, security threats have now been transferred to the digital world, and they are afraid that children or young relatives might be radicalized online. Online extremism and radicalization presents a challenge that is more global than national, thus makes the necessity of cooperation even more pertinent. George Orwell was certainly right to suggest that to see what is in front of one's nose needs a constant struggle. And here we are to these times and nowadays when wrapping a lie around the truth or covering a lie with the truth has become as well a reality. When asked about the impact of disinformation, 76% across the region considered disinformation as a new way of warfare, almost same figure with 77% who see fake news as a big problem. Definitely, there is more on the security matter. 
We read these challenges as a call for all of us to think upon on how to better respond to the current regional security challenges, but also to the security threats foreseen in the post-COVID area. The presentation and the findings of the first ever regional security public opinion survey directly echo the voice of the biggest assets of the region, its own people. Timelier than ever, the security matter providing concrete and reliable data from the region aims also at contributing to the coordinated high-level efforts to identify, prevent, and combat threats to regional security. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for participating in this launching event. I would like to thank our guests as well, be those physical or, uh, or joining us uh, virtually for their contribution through the open discussions on the findings of the report. Last but not least, I would like to thank RCC staff, IISG staff who have intensively worked for the security matter. I'm looking forward to the discussions and takeaways since all I did up to now was just to pepper up your thoughts with some of the most interesting data from the security matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary General. Now, I would like to use this opportunity of having Brigadier General Mr. Foxat with us and ask him to deliver his speech as well. Thank you, General. The floor is yours. Madam Secretary General, I would like to thank the RCC for hosting this event and for the opportunity to join the discussion today. You know, feeling secure, just as much as physical safety and security is one of the basic needs as humans. And without it, we can't get on without our lives. So it's important for those who are responsible for keeping us safe to understand and respond to our concerns and fears. That is why institutions like the RCC are so important. They help build awareness, understanding, and facilitate debate. They encourage citizens to hold leaders to account. And with research like this, ensure that the concerns of ordinary citizens are not forgotten. And the RCC in particular recognizes that these discussions and our response to these challenges are most effective on a regional scale. No one nation can or needs to tackle these problems alone. There are always opportunities to work with and learn lessons from our friends. It's this principle that we are stronger together that NATO was founded on. And today, our societies and our economies face new, unpredictable, and international security challenges. Technology and cyberspace offer new benefits and opportunities, but they also help create new threats while breathing life into old ones. We face hybrid challenges from states working in the so-called gray zone, as well as threats from non-state actors, natural disasters, and unforeseen events. If we had been asked two years ago, few of us would have listed a global health pandemic as one of the biggest challenges we face. But now it's probably everyone in everyone's top three of possibilities. And it's easy to see why. The pandemic has destroyed lives and livelihoods. It's brought the world to a standstill. And all the while, efforts to respond have been hampered by disinformation and malign influence. But equally, we have seen how much more effective our response can be how much safer we can make our citizens and our communities 
by putting aside self-interest and working together. And that's what makes organizations like NATO so important by fostering the international cooperation, dialogue and understanding so that every day, as well as in times of crisis, resolving conflict, responding to natural disasters, we can work together, pool our resources and capabilities to protect our citizens and make lives better. Many of the security challenges we all face exist in the shadows, and they only come to light in time of crisis. And not until then are the benefits of working with an organization like NATO fully understood and appreciated. As with security, there will occasionally be a visible event that sparks media attention or political comment and brings NATO to the forefront of our minds, while the day-to-day, -day, day in, day out, hard work goes largely unnoticed. As part of NATO's Partnership for Peace program, my team is working hard every day in BIH, and similar teams work throughout the region and wider Euro-Atlantic area, from Serbia to Switzerland to help strengthen, modernize, and reform defense institutions to make them more agile, democratic, accountable, and capable of responding to any security challenge. These reforms extend into all parts of society, helping to increase stability that can bring investment, jobs, growth, and ultimately higher standards of living. And that's why research and discussions like this are vital. Public perceptions, they're not the whole story, but they're incredibly important to give decision makers insight into how to close the gap between public perception and the reality of our security environment. Thank you for the invitation to speak here today and for your efforts to find the common ground we can all stand on to improve conditions for everyone in Bosnia-Herzegovina. I'm looking forward to today's discussion uh, very much, and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. General. Uh, now we will have with us Andrea Cascone, who is the Adriatic and Western Balkans Director at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Italy. I would really wish Andrea to be with us here, standing in this very place, but unfortunately, due to COVID, it's not possible. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amar, and I share very much the same feeling. I wish I had the opportunity to be in Sarajevo with you this morning. Uh, hopefully, I mean, uh, uh, this uh, secure, this uh, uh, situation will change soon. We're really hopeful for the uh, a change in the way we're working. Uh, thank you so much for today's invitation. Uh, it is really an honor and a privilege to be the partner of RCC uh, in the uh, presentation of the first special edition of the Security Barometer Survey. I would like to make very briefly three points from uh, uh, Italy's point of view. First, security matters. It matters for citizens, it matters for companies and investors, and therefore it must matter for policymakers. The assessment of the perception of the threats is of paramount importance. It provides all governments a very useful tool to understand their performance, also from a point of view of their communication. The Balkan barometer is key for providing a snapshot of public and business sentiment in the Western Balkans. By including security in this year edition, the report stands out as a unique opportunity for governments in the region to understand the complexity of the challenges they must face and hopefully to fine tune their policies. Such an analysis is even more important in the current conjuncture due to the challenges introduced by COVID-19. This is particularly true also from another perspective. I refer to the activities related to the economic recovery from the socioeconomic consequences of the pandemic. 
since there is little doubt that criminal network will try their best to capture financial resources devoted to the relaunch of our economies. And that calls on stepping up uh, joint efforts against corruption. Security in the Western Balkans matters also for the partners of the region, starting with the neighboring countries, and Italy is one of them. Our interconnections with the Western Balkans run so deep that we rightly consider security in the region as a matter of our own national security. And security matters for the European perspective of the region that we firmly support. On this specific point, I want to underline that the region has undoubtedly made steadfast and significant achievements, including in terms of a more effective integration in the security system and networks such as Interpol and Europol. It is important to acknowledge what has been accomplished. Of course, more is required, and this is where international cooperation comes in. This leads me to the second point I want to underline. The Western Balkan region can count on Italy's full support in order to strengthen its operational capacity in the security sector. Italy is always given high priority to the stabilization of the region and to the integration into the European Union. For, the re for this reason, Italy has always been a partner for countries in the area in the security field. Over the past 30 years, we have created a wide and articulated framework of cooperation. We signed and implemented uh, many bilateral agreements aimed at fostering cooperation in a number of areas related to security. We carried out joint investigation, promoted exchange of know-how, carried out visits and developed contact between senior officials, keeping in mind the goal of coping with security challenges and supporting the integration of Western Balkans in the European Union. In fact, a significant part of our endeavor in the region has been dedicated to helping the countries in the European path. Today, we are implementing uh, in the implementing partner of the program IPA 2019, kind of serious crime in the Western Balkans. But I would like also to remember that Italy was uh, the implementing partner for IPA 2 program in 2017, which strengthened the capacity of the countries in the region to exchange data and information with you police networks. The IPA 2013 program on strengthening police cooperation and judicial system in the region, which also led to more than 50 transnational investigation against uh, or criminal uh, networks. And I would like also to recall our uh, role in implementing country-based programs such as PIMECA 5 in Albania and Ural in Montenegro. A key element of our partnership in the region on security has been uh, carried through uh, regional cooperation council. And I'm very glad that uh, this partnership is increasing and is strengthening. Together, uh, we organized the uh, Jumbo Conference in 2019 and 2020, and uh, where a number of key themes were uh, debated, such as transnational crime, terrorist threats, cyber crimes, and migration flows. We're willing to carry on this cooperation. We also joined last year the Integrative, Integrative Internal Security Governance, whose secretariat is hosted by RCC. We strongly believe this, this is a framework where initiative focuses on security sector can converge, creating in this way synergies and reducing overlaps. With this, I come to my uh, third and final point, that is the role of international uh, interregional cooperation. When you look at the spectrum of security threats, which are treated in the report, there is a common feature, and that is that the vast majority of them, not all of them, do not rest confined in a single country, but rather tend to spill over in the whole region. The COVID-19 pandemic is just the last example that shows us how important it is to work together in order to tackle effectively security threats. Data are crucial to have a real understanding of every phenomenon, and they're essential to design proper and targeted measures as it is the case in the security sector. I very much welcome the research, which is an absolutely well structured covering all aspects from fight against um, uh, terrorism, organized border security, from small arms threat to national disaster prevention and preparedness, including migration, hybrid threats, and disinformation, which is increasingly becoming a serious problem in the region. 
All these elements provide a comprehensive overview of the security perception in the Western Balkans. I conclude by congratulating RCC and uh, Madam Secretary General Menin Bregu, its partner for having uh, carried out an extraordinary work. And I look forward to hearing the panelists and the debate in the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Do we have Konstantin with us? No, unfortunately, Mr. Prevelakis couldn't join us due to technical difficulties. I would like to hear say that these two governments, Italy and France, are staunch supporters, not only board members of the RCC, but also staunch supporters of our security activities in the Western Balkans. We hope it will remain like that and we look very much forward to continue working with them. So usually the moderator's role is to wrap up the first panel. But instead of me doing that, uh, I would like uh, to have your attention uh, for the video that will in actually the best way wrapping up this part. And this is the, pre let's say, the world premiere of the video created by our PR team and our, our uh, partners and friends uh, with whom we are working uh, closely. So uh, can, we, can we have the video now? Ever wondered what Western Balkan citizens think about security, migrants, online radicalization, owning a gun, or fake news? Well, for the first time, we actually asked them. See their answers. 64% believe our region is a secure place to live, but 55% say they would feel insecure if foreign fighters and their families would return to their local community. 26% are very afraid because there are no efficient ways to control online radicalization. Organized crime is seen as a serious threat in the region by 82% of region citizens. And 55% think corruption is the main reason for low performance in fighting it. On the other hand, only 6% would consider owning a gun compared to the overwhelming 91% of those who wouldn't. When it comes to migrants, 70% believe they increase security risks and 62% favor fines, followed by expulsions when illegal migrants violate laws of the host. 68% believe illegal migrants should be placed to locked detention centers. Natural disasters, pandemic included but not limited to, are considered as a serious security threat by 77% and almost the same percentage believe the region would benefit from cooperation in this regard. And finally, fake news. 77% see it as a problem and 75% perceive this information as a new way of warfare. Every fifth Western Balkan citizen indicates that journalists are the first choice when it comes to those who should act to stop the spread of fake news. What do you think? So back to our studio. Uh, this short video was not only good wrapping up of the previous panel, but I think it's excellent intro for the next one uh, in which we are going to host uh, our friends who helped us uh, conducting this survey. Um, so if I just want technical, how, how can I call? Very good. Excellent. Uh, First of all, thanks uh, once again to our speakers at the intro panel. Uh, let me start uh, with this uh, panel trying to answer the most frequent questions that I've been receiving these days uh, from different people. Why security, security barometer? Why security, security meter? So far, a set of questions related to security have been conducted within the Balkan Barometer Survey, and you know it, uh, most of you actually know this flagship project of the RCC, in which we were actually uh, covering just a tiny segment of security cooperation in the region. Uh, but incrementally, we have come to realization actually that uh, 
uh, as we are embarking and ready to embark on more socioeconomic projects in the region. Uh, and I hope you would agree with me. There is no such thing such as uh, socioeconomic betterment without security cooperation, without rule of law, without secure environment for bringing about the change in this region. Uh, and this also brought us to the level of the holistic approach in our actions where we are starting adding up uh, justice and home affairs and security cooperation to our in entire uh, socioeconomic portfolio uh, to uh, embrace this holistic approach uh, in um, uh, moving things forward in the, in the Western Balkans. Uh, as portfolio has been growing, uh, and we have embarked also on many important security issues, one of them, one of them and projects, one of them, the integrative internal security governance, uh, which has uh, now come under the umbrella of the RCC. Uh, the, the first logical step actually, uh, uh, of course, besides uh, uh, sensing the polls and talking to respective governments and law enforcement institutions to also ask the ordinary people, what do they think about security challenges? What, what are their fears and their hopes? And this is how we came actually with the idea to launch uh, the first and to commission the first security barometer, uh, which uh, has been conducted by Indago among 6,000 citizens in the period of 28th January and 19th of February uh, this year. It has eight segments. Uh, perception of terrorism and violent extremism, organized crime, border security, perception on use and ownership and community safety related to firearms, perception of legal immigration, asylum seeking and humanitarian dimension of migratory movements, uh, perception on disaster prevention and disaster preparedness, perception on hybrid threats and disinformation as a new security challenge, and of course the general uh, security perception. Uh, what uh, has been repeated a couple of times uh, uh, in intro panel, uh, we have uh, done that in strong coordination and synergy with our regional partners. So the Southeastern and Eastern Europe clearing house for the control of small arms and light weapons and their experts helped us to shape up the questionnaire related to firearms. Migration, asylum, refugees and regional initiative MARI helped us with the questionnaire related to uh, immigration and migratory movements. Disaster Preparedness and Prevention Initiative, DPPI, was very instrumental in covering the part related to disaster preparedness and prevention, man-made disasters, and even this part related to pandemics. That is Observatorio Balkani and Caucasus, Trans Europa, the only organization which is not situated in the Western Balkan, but it is very much about the Western Balkans helped us a lot with the hybrid threats and disinformation. Last but not least, of course, we have internally, with the guidance of our experts from the ISG, covered PCVCT, organized crime, and border security. Someone once said that the overlapping and lack of coordination among the international organizations on the ground in the Western Balkan is a problem. But with this joint exercise and effort, we have showed as how such problem can be addressed. RCC as being umbrella organization with a strong political mandate and rest assured will continue doing this effort, pulling together and working together uh, in a coherent manner with all respective regional organizations with one simple aim when it comes to the regional cooperation, to establish the regional security cooperative order in the Western Balkans on the path towards the standardization with the European Union. As we have done this preparation together, it is quite logical that we do the presentation together. So it is my pleasure to have today uh, with us uh, live from Skopje, director of Mari, Sashko Kotsev. Uh, CSAC's expert on, on regional cooperation, um, Juliana Buzi, joining us from Belgrade, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, DPPI's director, Vladko Jovanovski from Ljubljana, Vladko, Thank, thank you and, and welcome. And of course, Luisa Chiodi, Directress of the OBCT, connecting from Trento, and Head of the ISG Secretariat, Agron Soyati, with me in this improvised, improvised studio. Uh, 
Let me go just quickly like this. I know we already showed uh, the main findings, but let us remind on some general perception because before I really start uh, asking questions to our panelists. So we see here that generally 64% of respondents deemed that the Western Balkan is a secure place to live. 56 of them seem to be very satisfied with their personal security. However, there are top five uh, things uh, and issues that they deem are very important in security uh, and or main uh, uh, security issues that have a main negative impacts. And let me tell you something, in all Balkan barometers so far, economic crisis, poverty and social exclusion has been pinpointed as one of the most important one, uh, uh, as, as it even comes to the security. Crime and organized crime, drug, drug trafficking, pandemic, natural and man-made disasters and migratory crisis or migrant crisis. Uh, when, when it comes to uh, what are the most pressing challenges in our region uh, and they should address uh, when it comes to security, then uh, we have this ratio, as you can see it here uh, on this uh, screen. Uh, 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 it is very important uh, uh, to, to, to actually say that the organized and transboundary, uh, transboundary organized crime is really uh, ranked as, as the most uh, detrimental challenge uh, in the Western Balkans, uh, following uh, by 88 and 86 uh, uh, percent related to, to terrorism, uh, cyber security, and uh, uh, other other similar threats. Now, I'm starting, uh, uh, sorry. I'm starting this round of questions with you, Agro. 82% of people consider, uh, 88, sorry, um, uh, uh, that the fight against the terrorism is one of priorities. So what should we do, in your opinion, at the regional level? and even at the domestic level, in order to meet such expectations. First, I, yes, yes. Uh, first uh, thank you, Amer, for making the IG part of the whole, let's say, engagement on this uh, security barometer, which is actually very important. The general said this morning, public perception is not everything, but it's quite an important tool to understand how this is addressed. So coming to your question, when we say 88% of the public thinks that this is an important terrorism and PCVE, I think this actually goes in the very same line with the global trend. I mean, uh, judging from the events, start with the ISIS and Daesh from the 2011 and 12, now, the entire world actually came into action. We had uh, three specific uh, UN resolutions exactly on this uh, subject, which comes with the uh, freedom of travel and the information exchange or the financial investigations and support of any kind, criminalizing, actually participating in uh, uh, foreign uh, military structures of any kind, unless you represent the state, etc., etc. So uh, it was actually, we all agreed uh, back in uh, 2014 and 15, it was, when it was a peak in two things. First, it was a very high recruitment from even Western Balkans, of the citizens, some of them family included, joining to Daesh in Syria and Iraq. And we still have a problem of returnees, which we'll speak also later. But uh, <clears throat> besides that, we saw uh, quite a threat because we all agreed also that the ISIS had quite a successful PR strategy. They were able actually to really uh, bring fear in our citizens, in our societies. And that's why we took together a lot of measures. So this perception fits exactly to the situation we had back then. And I think uh, all the institutions have taken it uh, absolutely very seriously because now we have uh, structures in place, we have a new legal frame in place which regulates uh, different types uh, of uh, this, let's say, the need to be filled from the online elements to the physical elements. 
more measures have been taken into the uh, border security. Now, uh, strengthened uh, the regional cooperation or global cooperation. Now it's uh, much uh, easier to reach information from point A to point B whenever it's needed and it's considered necessary from the law enforcement. But also, oh, I think we have, uh, it did provoke, and we see this as a positive uh, outcome, it did provoke the whole society approach measures of uh, types of measures. So now we have civil society, we have religious communities, we have the media more aware and more proactive. So I think this have caused quite a, let's say, a, a positive dynamic, which makes and shrinks the space that uh, the ideology can uh, be uh, implanted, but also they organize uh, groups who are engaged in recruitments or where find it more difficulties. So nowadays, I think it's much harder to have signs of radicalization or uh, signs of uh, terrorism uh, preparations, not actions because that will be too late, without being uh, spotted or reported, or at least we have quite a, a mechanism in place. If I can get my power presentation back just for a second, please, uh, to move it to this slide, which for me is really interesting when, it, when we are talking about the fight, uh, fight against the terrorism. Uh, people seem to be quite aware of the necessity for regional cooperation, especially law enforcement cooperation, exchanging the information, not only with European Union, but also within the region. So uh, what the ISG is doing in that respect, because uh, you have a mandate there, and uh, can, you, can you comment on that? Oh, well, uh, very briefly, for those who are not familiar with the IISG, this is a mechanism created from the Western uh, Balkan six partners in a level of uh, Minister of Interiors and uh, Security. It has come under the umbrella of the RCC regionally, and that's why we are actually playing this role, and we've been working much uh, earlier on all security issues and trying to balance this with all the economic and other uh, elements, let's say, as RCC is uh, daily working. So. Uh, what ISG is uh, doing, we are uh, focusing on three pillars, one of which is uh, counterterrorism and pri uh, prevention and countering violent extremism. The second is organized crime and then is border security. What uh, we are doing now is exactly uh, exercising the needs mapping report for the entire region, which comes uh, to highlight from the partners but it's not just on the six Western Balkan partners. We have uh, all the EU institutions engaged on security. We have uh, a lot of uh, EU member states. We have uh, US and UK also providing support to the ISG process in uh, different pillars, as I mentioned. So right now, exercising this needs mapping, we are creating quite a very good integrated idea what it is needed. We don't uh, refer it uh, logistically, but uh, more also focusing on the regional frame, meaning like uh, what partners should uh, take in consideration in what sort of proportional when it comes to legal, institutional setup, capacity building, and coordination communication. So it is happening, and I think this is in a, in a very good timing, excellent timing, I can say, to have the public perception insights so then we are going with a further step two and three to put this in a, in a parallel, how this does match the priorities coming from institutions, but also the responsibilities and capacities to cope with those uh, perceptions. So it's a lot happening. Thank you. Uh, before we move to the organized crime and border security, and I'd like to explain that actually, uh, since the ISG covered these two parts as well, I will focus a couple of my next questions to Agron as well. Uh, I, uh, with no intention to monopolize, but simply to follow the, the path of the security barometer. Uh, the online radicalization, the people are seem to be aware also uh, with a very wide margin, <coughs> high margin about the online radicalization, but uh, let's leave that for the next panel that will follow up after this one. Uh, uh, or organized crime, uh, as I said at the very beginning, is deemed to, to be perceived actually as a as, as very, very um, uh, detrimental challenge uh, to the entire betterment, uh, the overall betterment in the region. Uh, uh, so uh, where do you think uh, uh, countries are losing their pace against the organized crime? 
Well, uh, thank you again for the question. Uh, I may say also that countries are not losing the face, but the threat coming from the organized crime is coming on the increase, not only in the Western Balkans, as actually it's more global in a European way. We see statistics, statistics coming from uh, Europe all as well. Now, if we compare this to uh, counterterrorism, let's say, in counterterrorism, there is an ideology. So in long run, there is, the threat is more imminent in terms of physical uh, security. When it comes to organized crime, people do not feel that physical insecure because it's not uh, uh, targeting the individuals or the public itself, but actually it's, tar it's targeting their life, the way of living, because it's a lot of money. If you see you know, the amount of uh, money, the financials that organized crime has around, I mean, it has more than uh, 30 million at least uh, annually uh, euros on only in migration, 30 to 50 million euros in, in a year, let's say, in the region going through the illegal migration. But we'll see statistics coming from uh, Mari and other colleagues as well. But uh, then, if, if you include all the nature of crimes from uh, narcotics to trafficking human beings, uh, weapons, etc., you know, it becomes really, you know, uh, a problematic in, in both aspects. First, if we put vis-a-vis -vis to the uh, state budget we have in total and uh, the capacities that they pose to disbalance the whole uh, this battle, let's say, but also our societies are more homogeneous. So it does actually bring uh, or make it quite difficult in two things because penetration of organized crime through corruption to other elites, it becomes present. But also in a, in, in a region, then uh, we are living in a, in a close uh, cycle societies that uh, pretty much we know everyone. So it becomes quite complex to, to fight it. So that's why when the public have this perception on organized crime, I think that is more connected with uh, all checks and balances in the way how the yeah. governments can uh, effectively work and provide. Thank you. Uh, uh, it seems that also people understand something that I think you found out in your communication with law enforcement institutions on the ground, that the low capacity, the lack of, of internal capacity to fighting the organized crime is one of the, one of the problems. But uh, for the sake of time, let, let us move further to the uh, last uh, set of questions related to the border security. And if I may ask you once again to bring back my PowerPoint presentation so that we can just display here uh, the findings related, related to that issue. Uh, it seems that, it seems that uh, border security is uh, being uh, uh, perceived through the prism of illegal migration only. Although we have here a high margin of people who are content with the uh, with, uh, uh, level of the border security uh, in, their, in their economy. Uh, but, but on the other side, and I'm puzzled, puzzled a little bit uh, by the fact that uh, on one side they are content with the border security, on the other side we have, uh, have transboundary organized crime flourishing. Are we missing the target here? Uh, can, you, can you, I mean, what is your, what is your take on that? Well, uh, we again all this uh, are talking here about the public perception. So, uh, and border and illegal migration are directly connected. So, uh, as you found out from the barometer, you see that uh, people think there is quite a threat coming from illegal migration. Seventy more percent people think that they do harm our security. So uh, people have the tendency to see this directly connected. But then, you know, first, uh, when we discuss illegal migration, this is not, let's say, uh, let's say a, a sort of a, a norm having our borders provoked with a high amount of illegal migrants. We saw this, uh, I mean, phase coming on 2015, and now it's coming uh, the, uh, much less and less every year. So we are not in that. But borders are daily provoked through, through the local and uh, regional and transnational organized crime. What we see was happening, and the findings actually also from we have a uh, through through findings from UNODC also from a global initiative who found that 
regional organized crime groups do see no, not any hesitation to cope among themselves, despite of religion, ethnicity, or passports or whatever. So, uh, and we are actually taking a lot of measures in the border cooperation, uh, partners with each other, but also institutionally, there is a more uh, setup of, of uh, rules and norms and uh, exercises. However, have in mind that uh, there are uh, quite serious challenges, and that's why chapter 23 and 24 are the most uh, difficult chapters that we are actually discussing, negotiating with EU for full membership versus the others. So I think it is important, and it is a quite a good reason why the public have that perception towards the borders, have in mind now that borders have been, uh, let's say, uh, addressed from also counterterrorism angle, we have uh, two uh, first, uh, all borders in the region are uh, connected with a database from uh, Interpol or also with a PRI and API, which have quite uh, information afterwards, but in advance about all the movements and individuals who can harm our, uh, let's say, security. So things are, are getting improved absolutely, but have in mind that uh, uh, also, the, the other side, the organized crime, is moving, is changing. Now, a lot of things are happening online. Mm. We, when we have in mind the, the, the physical sort of border, now even the, the exchange are taking place. Also, uh, just to illustrate this, we had a case when uh, drones were being used to lift up to 18 kilos of narcotics from one border to the next border in a range of 20 kilometers. Mm. So, and this, you know, all uh, makes quite a difficult, let's say, for law enforcement, but... Thank you. And now we are moving to uh, the second part related to perception of uh, use, ownership, and community safety related to firearms. Juliana, you are with us here. Thank you for being with us. And actually, this infographic shows clearly, I mean, the tendency of people not having an appetite to hold a gun. Uh, but uh, I'm a bit puzzled here, given the fact that illegal trafficking and possession of firearms still represents a huge issue in the region. So we have some encouraging trends displayed here, but situation on the ground is uh, still, I would, I would say, humbly uh, uh, dangerous. So how would you comment this? And please, uh, before I give the floor to you, if you feel free to comment also the other parts that were covered by Agron so far, so there is no restriction uh, uh, after all, because I think that we are going to have a round of, let's say, the comments at the very end from all of you. Juliana. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, first of all, good morning to all the participants and uh, um, thank you for the invitation, but also congratulations for this very first uh, security barometer for the launch and uh, also for including specific questions that are related to the threat comings from, uh, from firearms in the, in the Western Balkans. I would like to first stop actually on the very positive, good finding, the 91% actually uh, of people who responded no to the question whether they would own a gun. Uh, and this considering also the limitations of the methodology uh, because when it comes to this very sensitive question, and uh, um, taking into consideration that um, many respondents uh, could tend towards a socially desirable uh, a response as well. But this is a, a, an increase uh, and uh, we need to take it as a very positive funding because, finding because it's an increase also from the previous surveys that have been conducted that were at, uh, at the rate of 70% actually. And what makes it also uh, in terms of like uh, important is when we need to see, when we see in uh, um, the question on what were the reasons that why would um, the uh, people own, own a gun, uh, we had a 16% that was related to tradition or culture. And this is also a very important finding because it shows that uh, um, the perception of uh, people in the Western Balkans holding a weapon at home or holding a weapon because of uh, mere tradition or culture, this is uh, people are moving away from this, uh, this perception. Just to elaborate a bit further on, uh, on the um, demand for, uh, for weapons from previous surveys that we had as CSAC, 
uh, we found out that um, um, any previous experience or exposure to firearm increased actually the um, desirability, let's say, for a weapon from, uh, from people. Uh, at least 59%, for example, of respondents in a previous survey who had a gun directed at them responded actually that they would also own a gun. And uh, uh, also the period when uh, the exposure to the gun violence or uh, the um, experience with the gun itself happened also influenced, uh, influenced the opinion whether they would want a gun or not. In addition, the readiness to acquire firearms, uh, it increases when it, the respondents in particular uh, believe that it, this will improve safety. Um, in relation to your uh, other question, I mean, the second part of the question in terms of illicit possession and uh, the, the amounts, the estimated amounts on, uh, of illicit possession, but also the weapons used in trafficking, let me also emphasize that majority of weapons in legal possession in the Western Balkans are a legacy of like parts, uh, past conflicts or uh, internal unrest, for example. And many of them have, uh, have found their way also into trafficking as part or uh, in support of various types of crimes, including here also, also the organized crime. And tackling this requires a different response. And that ranges from uh, the intelligence-led policing, including like um, increasing the number of seizures of the uh, of the illicit uh, firearms in in hands of the people, but also uh, and and very importantly, awareness awareness on the risks of this uh, of the weapons and awareness on their uh, on their misuse and the western balkans i uh, i'm glad uh, i'm glad to say that have the western balkans have stepped up their uh, their commitment towards in particular towards these areas with the adoption also of the of the uh, the roadmap on sustainable solutions towards uh, um, illicit possession uh, in misuse but also trafficking of of firearms uh, that's from my side on this specific question. And that's result, I mean, that you just mentioned, thanks to relentless engagement of the CSAC on the ground, setting up the framework, the network, and co commitment of the governments. Can I get back my, my PowerPoint presentation just to, to display one very interesting, uh, oh, sorry, one very interesting slide here? So, mm. um, Juliana, uh, Maybe I'm mistaken and correct me. I mean, don't be uh, humble with me. I mean, just, <laughs> just contradict, please. But, but um, my understanding of, of this particular trend and slide and finding, uh, the main reason to own a gun, according to most respondents in the Western Balkan, 48% of them would be for the protection and save it safety so the private protection and safety safety followed followed at some distance by hunting and sport and those kind of activities does it mean does it mean that citizens would incline to take security in own hands and to what extent that can be dangerous and to what extent we can read that as lack of trust in the security or law enforcement institutions on the ground Yes, I think uh, uh, part of your questions were part of the answers as well. <laughs> so, but let me uh, just uh, emphasize and clarify here that uh, the 48 percent of people who responded that they would need a gun uh, um, um, for protection and safety are those respondents actually who said that they would own a gun. So, not not all the respondents. But this is also, I mean, uh, understandable as well. We also need to take into account that part in, in order to uh, acquire uh, legally a firearms uh, based on requirements by the law, part of these requirements, it could be also for uh, personal protection, but also for hunting and sport for a certain category of, of, of firearms. But in terms of those illicitly, illicitly possessed, we need to be uh, as you, uh, to be um, to take into account, as you mentioned as well, that it goes hand in hand with the security as well. It is connected to the security uh, situation in the country or any uh, any external threats as well. And um, it we have seen, for example, in the last uh, uh, in the last year, 
maybe also due to the pandemic as well, we have seen a rise in crime uh, um, using firearms throughout the Western Balkans. And this is also particularly, for example, for armed robberies as well. People need to see actually the police uh, to, um, as their security provider. So mm. it goes hand in hand with the increase of trust in the police um, and the improvement of security uh, it is a must actually also in terms of this, uh, this specific uh, question. Um, yeah, I think um, there is another um, very interesting finding from the, from the barometer, which is the question, how threatened do you feel from actually from uh, firearms, from uh, gun violence and related to crimes or domestic violence? And we have seen, unfortunately, uh, a slight increase. It's very slight, but it's an increase from the previous years, uh, 47% of people throughout the Western Balkans responded that they feel threatened also from this, uh, these type of crimes and uh, related to, to firearms. So I think it is connected to, that, to this, it is connected to the general sense of security that I think it was influenced uh, last year uh, from the pandemic. It was, it, it, this was also uh, at the global level, not only, uh, not only uh, in this region as well. Yeah, and particularly, Interesting is the gender gender perspective and gender segment of armed violence. Can you just shortly tell us uh, your comments about the findings there, which I also find very interesting, honestly. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the misuse, the use of firearms is very, very gendered, actually. And all our studies conducted in the past, but also the perception survey clearly demonstrate that. Uh, it's uh, highly uh, differentiated for, uh, uh, for women and men with respect to firearms ownership, uh, use, but also misuse. Unlike men, for example, women on, uh, actually own only a minor share of firearms, less than 3% in Southeast Europe, and hardly ever misuse the firearms. It's almost like 1.6% of all the perpetrators with, uh, of firearm-related crimes but they are 10 times more likely to fall victim of firearms misuse than to misuse it. Patterns of the women's uh, victimization actually are directly linked to domestic violence. 61% of all killed women were killed by a, fe a male family member. 43.5% of all women killed by an intimate partner in Southeast Europe were killed with firearms, and this is almost half. Uh, but also men are in Southeast Europe are most often at risk of firearms in misuse from other men they know, that it could be friends, acquaintances, and neighbors. These different experiences and different risks that women and men are facing uh, are reflected in different attitudes towards the firearms. CISAC actually is providing a comprehensive support in this regards to the governments in the region to effectively address the use of firearms in domestic violence. And this is done, first of all, through data collection and research and analysis on specific risks related to the presence and use of firearms, in particular in context of domestic violence. In addition, awareness raising on the dangers of misuse of firearms in the context of domestic and intimate partner violence. There have been targeted campaigns, awareness campaigns in several jurisdictions focusing in this particular aspect, actually. And other end campaigns are planned also for the, for the near future. Training has been conducted to relevant institutions in development of tools for the professionals, dedicated training to, of, uh, to um, members of various agencies or institutions that are working directly on arms control. Uh, support has is been provided also to the policy and legislative developments, mm -hmm. including what is ongoing right now. It's a very thorough review of the legal and policy framework in place related to arms control in each of the jurisdictions of the Western Balkans, as we call it the gender screening of the policy and legislation framework. In addition, we are supporting the convergence between small arms control policies and measures to combat domestic violence with the use of firearms. It's a really very important aspect. I cannot agree more with you. Thank you, thank you, Juliana, very much. Now, now we are moving to this segment uh, on perception of illegal immigrants, asylum seeking and humanitarian dimension of migratory movements. Can I get my PPP back? 
is just to display one very interesting infographics here. Um, okay. So, uh, Sashko, uh, we knew it, we know it. I mean, uh, it's everywhere in the news that people seem to be really alarmed by the uh, migratory movements and illegal uh, immigrations. Uh, but uh, uh, to me, 70% believe that migrants entering the respondents' respective economy increase the security risks for the economy. So the perception of migrants as a direct, direct security threat is, can we say that this is something really alarming or this is only my percep uh, personal perception? Good morning, Kamer. Good morning to everyone. First of all, thank you for inviting Mari to this event, and I am personally honored to be uh, part of uh, today's activities. Well, when it comes to the illegal migration, uh, I would like just to mention the, the, the parallel between illegal migration and fight against organized crime. Namely, illegal migrants uh, are more visible to the citizens. They see migrants in the streets, unlike the other forms of organized crime, which are hidden from the public and due to their hidden nature. Organized crime groups are more organized. They uh, are adapting to the new circumstances than, than the law enforcement agencies, which uh, was exposed during the pandemic. And very often, they do not need to cross traditional border crossing to operate. The virtual space nowadays offers endless opportunity for organized crime to flourish. But when it comes to the individual illegal crossings and organized crime, I personally believe that the illegal border crossing do not undermine the state security, but the organized crime does. I would like to share uh, my opinion about the, the fight against organized crime. This fight has to be based on intelligence data. Now, the way that the border checks are performed in the region shows something else. Namely, I see the border checks uh, as a relatively unintelligent control point, a control point which is in every map and is by definition unintelligence. Criminals can prepare for border crossing. Border crossing with respect of organized crime are also unintelligent because it's it, it is in the criminal offender hands and it is criminal decision when and which border he or she wants to cross, at which time, with which car, or by foot, or bicycle, or motorcycle. It was mentioned by uh, Agron that organized crime group groups use drones, but they also bribe officers in some countries and I personally believe they know better about law enforcement vulnerabilities and weaknesses than the politicians know. It is my thesis and deep conviction that police will hardly catch a big fish at a classic border checkpoint with classic means. I have never seen crime statistic which convinced me that uh, a border is a promising control point for organized or serious crime. State security, is undermined by organized crime, which must be investigated and caught otherwise by financial investigation, tax and fraud investigation, money laundering analysis, etc. I would stop here and giving back the floor to you. And if there are any questions, I just share this thought with you. So I'm open for discussion. I uh, thank you, Sashko, very much. I have a few qu more questions for you, but if I can get again uh, infographics back so that I can show something which to me honestly is worrisome. Really, I mean, uh, uh, these two slides, 68% uh, of people, of respondents believe that illegal migrants should be placed to locked detention centers. So their freedom of movement as such as if they are detected being illegal migrants should be somehow under control. Um, uh, sorry, I uh, need to go back. I'm not. And uh, here, 62% uh, of them think that they should be expelled from the country uh, if they found um, uh, to be there on illegal, or, or illegal terms. Uh, so, uh, uh, Sashko, uh, as, as representing the organization that also 
taking care of this humanitarian dimension of uh, uh, migrants in general. How do you actually see uh, these two findings in the entire context uh, of the uh, migratory or illegal uh, immigration in the Western Balkans? Uh, thank you, Amar, for the question. For, uh, let me start by saying that uh, all the countries from the region have developed their system uh, to protect those qualifying for international protection. And I think that the, the legal base of all the countries actually is in line with EU acquis. However, the cases uh, of uh, breaking the law should be uh, dealt in appropriate way in accordance with the national law. Uh, I think, I personally think that the region should fight against stigmatization of uh, migrants by helping them to integrate in our societies. And the best model for integration is the socio-economic one. Uh, additional campaigns for awareness raising of migrants and people on move should be created, where all of them will be informed about their rights, but also obligation and punishment for abusing and violation of laws. Campaigns for decreasing the level of xenophobia in our region, as well as uh, supporting the Mali Admit Participants Administration in providing better response to creating and updating the present emergency and contingency plans. I would also like to share uh, some thoughts about the new pact on migration and asylum. Uh, I think with its, with its implementation, some of the concerns and proposals will become obsolete. The EU has a new concept in mind where identities and applications for international protection, mm -hmm. like asylum, 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 are checked outside EU borders, which might be on the ground on Western Balkan or even beyond. I believe that the previous EU migration concept have widely failed in the past as the EC admits in the introduction of the new EU and uh, in the new Pact on Migration and uh, Asylum. The overall goal must be to turn illegal migration into legal migration. Here, I do not advocate for an indiscriminate acceptance at all of all applications for protection. Definitely not. Migration must be regulated and the countries must be able to decide whom they will accept or who do they will not accept. We from governments, we have a responsibility for both. We must protect our population and migrants seeking access. Just saying no does not work and is also not in our national interest. I advocate for a change of paradigm. paradigm. It is my very personal opinion that some Western Balkan countries could be perfect immigration countries. For instance, why not North Macedonia to, not to accept uh, foreigners who want to run farms or do for uh, reforestation or cultivate pharmaceutical herbs? Maybe Albania needs urgently well-trained personnel for its fast-growing tourism industry. Montenegro is approximating you very fast and has more common interests with EU member states than with its neighbors, and so on. We do not rationally analyze the facts. Which welcome Western Balkan country needs which labor force profile? I believe that it, uh, in line with the current uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis, the whole Western Balkan needs medical staff, just like EU. But the Balkan export skilled medical human resources and medical a labor force. This should be stopped by incentives and agreements. What we practice is a stone age model. You get your exam and you're leaving the country. I personally, I still dream of triangular model where jobs, job seekers and vocational training synergize or are at least interconnected by a regional information system. For example, let's say 3000 workers are needed for harvesting wine grapes in autumn in Macedonia. Nationality is not important. Who trains them? Who secures their rights? How they are insured? Maybe the same 3,000 low-skilled workers can in springtime clean the beaches of Montenegro or do constructional works. 
but I have really many ideas and uh, I, will, I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, Agron wants to comment shortly on... Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Amir. Just uh, actually what strikes me is that the high percentage of uh, public perception in resisting or seeing them as a threat. And I'm uh, thinking like uh, from the Vienna Institute measuring migration, only in the last seven years, the almost half million Albanians left Albania going to EU. In, uh, so even the region is quite a high percentage migration, let's say, area. Mm -hmm. So now, and this is a little bit odd that uh, even being a source of migrants, being so resistant towards migration, and I, I, I now I, I would like to highlight that it, there are two reasons among the others. And one is that uh, our populations mainly can, uh, they do enjoy the visa-free movements, which is not the case in the other side. But also, I think we have to see and blame also the fake news uh, role, yeah. because yeah. it has been, uh, you know, uh, introduced like, uh, you know, these people may stay forever or they can take jobs or they really possess a physical threat as uh, they stay here, etc., etc. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sashko. Thank you, Agron. Now we are moving to perception on disaster prevention, and disaster preparedness. Vladko, thank you for being with us. I remember, you know, it was it was just recently, you know, where the region was plagued by earthquakes, floods, uh, repeated ex earthquakes to, to an extent that, that you know, I, I uh, read somewhere, you know, we're just waiting for Godzilla to show up and to surrender, you know, I mean, it's really like, and then uh, can, can you, can I get my uh, infographics back, please? And then, of course, uh, this very much influenced the sentiment of of the ordinary people when it comes to perception of the natural disasters as a direct security threat. But not, on, not, not only security, but it, it hampers pretty much the economic development as well and the social, social cohesion. So um, uh, 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 I, I, I simply need your comment because you are the one who has been dealing with that uh, for many years. Thank you, Amer. Uh, thank you for having me today. I'm, I'm really glad that uh, something that we started discussing a year ago, uh, now it's, it's uh, operational and it has its um, uh, results. Uh, thank you for including the, the topic in the, uh, this year Balkan Barometer. Uh, it is a, a reminder for all of us who are working in this area that um, uh, actually, uh, to say, uh, why are we doing what we, we do? And uh, the public opinion is, is very, very important. In between our donor reports, conferences, workshops, and seminars, uh, usually we tend to forget about the, the people, and this is why we do the, the job that we uh, do. Uh, am I surprised by the, the, the high percentage of uh, perceived uh, threat of the of the uh, population in Western Balkans. No, to be honest, I, I'm not. It would be the opposite if the, the percentage was uh, smaller, uh, because we, we learned our lesson uh, in a harder uh, way over the years. We were exposed to, as you mentioned, uh, earthquakes, forest fires, uh, uh, floods are occurring uh, on, on, on regular uh, uh, events. So it just shows the, the, that the people in, in the Western Balkans uh, are remembering those uh, horrible um, uh, events. And uh, they are uh, part of our daily uh, living. Uh, as climate change is progressing, uh, the scenarios are not so positive. So we need to, to learn um, to live with this type of uh, events. Uh, we need uh, to, uh, to learn about them uh, and we need to, to learn how to mitigate and how to prepare for their, for their um, uh, consequences. Are we seeing um, uh, a stronger push from the uh, population to, towards the governments to, to change something in that uh, direction? Uh, I cannot say uh, that this is, this is happening. Uh, I haven't seen elections uh, lost on the topic of uh, disaster prevention or disaster preparedness, Not, neither they were won on, on, on this uh, topic. So, 
uh, although there are uh, a lot of efforts ongoing on national and, and, and regional uh, level, uh, it's still not um, a, a topic which is constantly um, used by the by the government uh, to to ad advance in this by the governments to advance in this um, uh, context. <laughs> Uh, we also saw one infographics before uh, related to the overwhelming majority of 78% believe that the region would benefit from the cooperation. And we actually experienced that during the, the pandemics as well, because RCC was very instrumental in putting together what we call the green lanes in order not to uh, uh, leave uh, 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 the region completely blocked off uh, from the supply chain in the times of uh, the must, must uh, urgent needs. So do you think, and to what extent, we should be working together, despite to the fact that, of course, uh, most of economies in the Western Balkans are already part of EU civilian protection mechanism. But does that exclude an option that we go for also, let's say, the Western Balkan and even Southeast Europe uh, activity on uh, introducing uh, joint protocols, how to deal with, the, with, with such a challenges from pandemic to, to uh, the disasters, to, to even go uh, more uh, uh, coherently to that direction. What, what would you advise uh, in that respect? Yes, definitely. I mean, it goes without saying, just sitting together on this forum means that we are uh, for regional cooperation, we are for enhancing those instruments that are vital for uh, first uh, relief and first uh, response. Uh, but also uh, we are uh, willing for cooperation in uh, the phases which are prior to, to natural disaster, meaning prevention and, 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 and preparedness. Is the region uh, uh, ready for uh, a joint uh, response to, to uh, natural uh, disasters? I cannot say so because uh, the concept was tested a couple of years ago with a European project called IPA floods, where the intention was to create multinational response uh, uh, teams. Uh, I cannot say that that was quite uh, a successful uh, story, although the intention was quite uh, noble. Uh, however, I think that the region and especially the countries representing the region are still not on that level of uh, readiness, uh, meaning that their capacities to respond are still um, weak uh, to, to, to think about the next level and that is creating joint uh, teams, joint response teams that will, um, that will react uh, uh, jointly. Uh, what is uh, remarkable for the region is the sentiment of uh, solidarity. Uh, although maybe we, we don't have that much uh, um, uh, advanced response capacities, the, the solidarity between the nations um, exists. Uh, I cannot say uh, one example in the past that due to political reasons, uh, assistance was prevented to, to reach the, uh, from the nations to reach the, uh, the final uh, destination. So this element uh, exists in the, in the region and we need to even enhance it and build it, uh, build it um, yeah, even, even stronger. All the aspirations of the uh, countries in the, in the regions are towards uh, the European Union. Union. It's, it's normal. You have a, a response mechanism over there, the Union Civil Protection Mechanism, which has particular standards that needs to be fulfilled in order to, uh, to reach the, the, necess the necess necessary quality. Uh, level and uh, we as regional organization uh, are, are kind of uh, juggling in between uh, those uh, two areas, the nation needs uh, versus the, the, the more uh, regional um, uh, approaches. However, uh, without strong national uh, civil protection, preparedness and response capacities, I think that we are too early to think about some kind of a format uh, on, on joint uh, regional response uh, mechanism. Thank you. Uh, I can echo that uh, by saying actually that uh, we have a Duras protocol, we have strong commitment of governments uh, in the Western Balkans, but also governments within the Southeast Europe uh, through this uh, Southeast Europe 2030 strategy in which RCC is relentlessly working, uh, at least to highlight this socio-economic uh, dimension 
uh, and developmental dimension of the uh, of the pan, uh, of the uh, natural disasters, uh, which which is very important. Thank you, uh, thank you, Vlatko, uh, for being with us. Now I'm moving to our uh, last panelist, uh, but not least, of course, uh, dear Luisa. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, I'm opening uh, then again uh, this set of questions with the infographics, if our technical people uh, allow allow me to to just display. Uh, this slide related to yes, uh, so uh, we have we have really really good understanding of the detrimental potential of disinformation and fake news in the region among ordinary people. Uh, to my humble opinion, this is already a good signal of progress, and uh, that we can maybe build our operation on and then try to really work uh, uh, even more coherently with the with the institutions. On the ground, what, what what is your what is what is your take of, of, of this of this finding? Thank you, Ambassador. Can you hear me? Yes, you do. Um, thank you, thank you, everyone, and um, good morning. Um, look, uh, indeed, we 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 have we are discussing about um, disinformation after a year of. Uh, pandemic, so of uh, uh, something that someone called even disinfodemic. So uh, having been overwhelmed by a terrible amount of information, much of it um, uh, which ha has been a form of disinformation around uh, the pandemic, the, the difficult experience we went through. Um, we, the Western Balkans are, uh, we know from uh, other uh, index like the Media Literacy Index, uh, an area where citizens are more vulnerable to, to disinformation than uh, their EU counterparts. But um, what the survey show is that um, there are also uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, awareness among citizens on uh, um, the risk that come from from this information, uh, which should encourage us to to be uh, clearly positive about um, our challenge. Let's say, um, indeed, uh, uh, the disinformation that spread throughout this year focused on on the uh, pandemic uh, spread around the causes uh, the solutions so everything was made more difficult uh, here in, in the balkans as well as in the rest of uh, the world but but in the balkans it, it alimented also uh, ideas uh, uh, including uh, the geopolitical struggles uh, around the region uh, of being target of such struggles so it associated uh, as, as as usual with um, um, if the feeling of insecurity and when uh, did we feel less secure than uh, um, during a pandemic uh, um, it's clearly it has been a clearly a very difficult year for, for everyone thank you thank you Louise. it's very interesting how people also perceive in this uh, infographics uh, you, you you see clearly the trends uh, uh, that three areas of public life are considered to be threatened by international disinformation and hybrid threats the most. Uh, the finances, the trust in public institutions, um, trust, trust even in the EU uh, and the Euro-Atlantic path of, of some parts of our region. So it's, it's, it's very interesting uh, how, they, uh, how they understand uh, the challenge, uh, but also it's clear message to us that we should continue what we what we have already begun uh, last year, uh, raising the awareness, uh, but also working with the governments and in the st institutions on the ground. Uh, thank you, thank you, Luisa. Uh, we are running out of time a little bit, but since uh, actually Constantin joined us. I would actually, uh, first video actually helped me to wrap up the first panel. Now I would ask Konstantin to do my job and to wrap up this one uh, and to announce uh, our uh, cooperation uh, on, on Jumbo, Jumbo Security Conference, which we deem very important. Konstantin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amer. Uh, first of all, I'm really sorry for uh, joining you uh, late uh, due to a technical problem. Uh, thank you to your staff also for for its help. Uh, but fortunately, uh, I managed to follow the biggest part of this panel, which was, I think, one of the most the most important. And I have to say, uh, as you asked me to to, to wrap up, I have to say that 
it gave me uh, the conviction uh, that this barometer is very useful uh, in two ways. And it's very useful also from uh, the perspective of the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, which I represent. Uh, just, to, just to tell that, uh, as you know, um, French President Emmanuel Macron decided to, to launch a Balkan strategy two years ago, which is being now implemented. And uh, in security cooperation, my feeling is that besides the official objective, there are two main interests for us. First of all, uh, to make our perception and our efforts converge in dealing with security challenges in the Balkans, which are also European security challenges. Sometimes we have the feeling that we have exactly the same priorities, but in a somehow different perception, which is absolutely natural. Secondly, uh, second interest is to support the regional security cooperation, uh, which we see as a facilitator for the future of Europe, the future European integration of the whole region, and, non, and not of something to replace European integration. And thus, I, we see the Balkan parameter as a cornerstone of security cooperation. Firstly, and we saw that it gives us a precious insight on the perception of security challenges in the region. I saw very interesting things about migration, about natural disasters also. Uh, and uh, secondly, because it considers the Western Balkan countries and society as a whole, uh, and it's a, con a concrete contribution to the regional ownership. And there again, I saw very interesting things. Again, I take the example of natural disasters with this, let's say support to the idea of having a common mechanism or a common protocol. So, not to enter the details, I won't make this. Uh, I won't make the speech that uh, I was uh, was supposed to do before because a lot of things have been already said. But we already now know in France the interest of the Balkan barometer in the uh, field of uh, struggle against small arms and light weapons because we use it. It's, a, it's one of the tools of the roadmap which has been adopted uh, after the Frankfurt German initiative uh, on this um, in this field. But uh, this is a very, very interesting tool. Uh, it will be interesting uh, also for us in the support that we give to the RCC uh, and which we'll continue to give. And in this regard, I'm very, very happy also, as you told you, to announce that France will co-organize with the RCC the next Jumbo Security Conference in uh, uh, November or December. The date is still to be, to be fixed. Uh, let's keep fingers crossed that the conditions which are now better uh, will allow us to welcome you all uh, in Paris for substantial and constructive exchanges on the perspectives of regional security cooperation. And of course, once again, uh, the findings of the Balkan barometer, uh, I think, are an excellent basis, a very useful tool uh, in order to fix our agenda, our priorities, and uh, the substance of our debate. So thank you once again. Uh, sorry again for being late. And uh, I am looking forward uh, to our further exchanges during the seminar. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Konstantin, very much. Uh, now, uh, before I conclude this uh, panel, I need to ask, do we have any question from the audience? No, we don't. We have two. Uh, they have been answered. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I, I think uh, that uh, uh, I can only say uh, this was the first step. We will certainly continue with this effort as of tomorrow. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch with all of you, trying to kind of improve even uh, uh, the quality of the security Balkan barometer that is going to become one of the uh, important flagship uh, projects of our uh, security cooperation. Uh, to that end, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you, General, for being with us uh, uh, still here, uh, Madam Secretary General, our colleagues. Uh, we will continue with the next panel, uh, which will be chaired by my colleague, uh, Yorida Shitai. Uh, we'll just uh, make a short break in order to, uh, to, to put chairs at the right place and then to continue. Thank you very much once again.
Can you say something, please? In the mic microphone. Uh, one, two, three.
Hello, uh, hello, and welcome to this third session of today's seminar. With our esteemed panelists, we'll be discussing on radicalization and terrorism in virtual sphere and how to boost resilience among young people. We heard the findings of security matter earlier and uh, online radicalization of youth in Western Balkan 6 was listed as a big security threat. And I believe it is in this particular context that uh, our panel gains particular uh, importance, considering that 44% of the region's respondents indicated that there is a strong probability for online radicalization of their children or their relatives and friends, and therefore additional measures should be taken. While 26% of the interviewed population are very afraid because there are no efficient ways to control online radicalization. As a matter of fact, the whole societies of Western Balkans are uh, exposed to radicalization. But when it comes to young people, considering that they are always connected to internet, they are therefore more exposed to radically different uh, viewpoints, including extremist ideology. We live now in a digital area where internet has revolutionized the way we communicate, the way we create our networks. But at the same time, online spaces and online communities can provide also extensive opportunities to advance an extremist agenda. Thus, I believe uh, it is vitally important to better understand the relationship between online methods of human communication and the spread of violent extremism and related propaganda. These are the important topics that we will be discussing today with our panel. Our esteemed panelists will showcase positive initiatives that aim to deliver responses and solutions to the challenges posed by online radicalization and extremist propaganda. Uh, our talks will also be followed by a 15-minute uh, session of questions and answers, so you're pleased to, to comment or to ask questions through our platform. I will not be taking more valuable time from the time of our panelists, so uh, by starting to thank them all for, for being here today with us, I will start immediately with Mr. Albertani, uh, RICOS Secretary General. Mr. Hani has a long-standing experience of more than 22 years in managing and leading peace building and youth projects for a number of international organizations. He is a well-known peace promoter, mediator, and a trainer on important topics of peace building and human rights. Dear Mr. Hani, first of all, thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, we know that especially since 2020, the prevention of youth radicalization has been very high on RICO agenda. And uh, it is really very interesting for us to learn how has this pandemic and the consequent traveling restrictions affected your work in the field? And especially, how have you overcome these challenges? Uh, I also, maybe it's better to, to ask both questions or you'd like to answer first. Please let me know which is better for you. Yeah, you can you can do both questions, please. So I can make one presentation short. I, I can hear both questions. OK, thank you very much. And the second question would be, according to the recent press releases published by RICO, media manipulation and hate speech on the social media has been among the biggest drivers of youth radicalization. 
We would like to know how are you planning to address online youth radicalization and uh, online hate speech? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yorida. Thank you very much, uh, RCC and all the partners that put all these efforts to organize uh, this, this uh, workshop training uh, co conference. I, I, I followed it closely and I must admit from the beginning that I'm really uh, I, I really like all the results that you have produced as they will all serve us uh, and our purpose is to make this be uh, a region a better place to, to live, a place that is more secure and of course place that is uh, safer. This is a great work, but I also see it as a great tool for the future. I hope you all already considered uh, types of uh, longitudinal uh, uh approach to this uh, to this uh, tool as i really see a great perspective uh, per perspective in it especially when it comes to developing our programs and uh, projects in the in the fields this will definitely serve us a lot uh, in uh, developing our new strategy for for youth in the region of western balkans and uh, for which we are already starting the the process I also would like to use this opportunity, Yorida, and thank you uh, for, for, for uh, uh, putting the youth topic inside your, your agenda, but also uh, making space for, uh, for RICO. We hope that this type of uh, cooperation will continue in future. Yes, I'm new Secretary General, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, this cooperation will uh, stop. In a co in, in, uh, so in opposite, it will be strengthened even more with such such. Uh, projects that you have already started. Let me go to the to the questions that you have raised. And for the first one, I would like to be very short, which is related to, to COVID-19 and uh, the way how we, in fact, uh, uh, acted or reacted to the, to the pandemics. Of course, it was a, a, a challenging time for us, as it was for all the target groups that we were working with. And uh, mostly we are talking here about the, the, the youth. So as youth adapted to the, the changes and challenges of the pandemics and by uh, COVID-19, uh, they, they are, of course, even much better into adaptation than the older generation. We also in RICO try to do our best to, to adapt and by that uh, uh, be aware that, uh, that, that the COVID-19 actually changed or shaped our priorities and the ways how we, we set the priorities, especially in working on let's say soft skills, uh, such are uh, skills that are connected to peace and reconciliation as, uh, as, as topics that uh, we are directly working upon. So we tried to, uh, to, to continue creating moments for, for cohesion and platforms for, for uh, cohesion among youth, as well as uh, create channels of communication with them. Uh, it's interesting to, to be mentioned here that uh, we, in fact, during this uh, 2020, we increased or reached even, uh, let's say, 14, more than three times uh, more participants or target group than the previous year. Like we reached almost 14,000 youth uh, during the, the pandemics, which is, as I said, three times more, let's say, than 2018 or, or 19, and supported um, over 500 activities. We also converted the, the activities which is for us uh, it calculated roughly uh, uh, almost 150 percent uh, more activities than in the uh, previous years. But but let me go back now to the second question, which I think is the core uh, topic of the uh, of this workshop. And I guess uh, it relates more to to our our uh, our ma mandate. So here we talk about the hate speech as well as uh, radicalization, propaganda, fake news, and uh, disinformation. This, of course, has, have been, has been a topic of RICO since the, since the beginning, because uh, uh, from one side, I want to point out that the, all the projects that we are sub supporting uh, are also connected to peace and, and reconciliation. Therefore, directly we contribute to decreasing of the level of hate speech as well as uh, radicalization. Here I'm thinking mostly in the in sense of breaking down the enemy images, also uh, uh, working on eliminating stereotypes and, and prejudices, as well as healing or let's say 
creating those channels of communications that were, were that were damaged in the in the in the past. I'm thinking about channels of communication by uh, different ethnic or religious uh, communities living in the Western Balkans. As you already mentioned, I, uh, this uh, I, I'm a, a person that all, uh, worked almost uh, 30 years in peace building, and this is a topic of my heart when I talk with uh, for for uh, reconciliation and peace as well as security and uh, safety, especially of, of uh, youth. Uh, I tried sometimes to be a little bit even even uh, emotional, but for me, hate speech, in fact, is uh, mostly mostly a reflection of the unknown. Uh, it is in fact a fear from the unknown that we have created by by having this gap of uh, not allowing people to communicate uh, in the region of uh, Western Balkans, and by that, I think that uh, uh, radicalization is in fact um, putting putting the, this fear in motion. So if there is from one side the fear of the, from the unknown, uh, radicalization uh, from the other side is actually putting this fear in motion. So as long as we are focused on eliminating the unknown uh, by creating channels of communication, uh, or um, I'm thinking here also in terms of material uh, material terms, like creating roads, something or, or con connect, working on connectivity, uh, from one side, or creating uh, or working on behavioral issues like intercultural learning that we work, for example, in RICO more. That's, that's the, the only way how we can do all good for the region. Narrow understanding is, in fact, uh, narrow understanding of these notions is, in fact, something that will not help us uh, counter neither the, the hate speech or the, or the radicalization, especially uh, among youth. In a way, I want to point out that, um, that uh, if we all see ways to create synergies and ways to complement each other's results and then and, and successes, only then we can great, make a greater impact in the joint, joint efforts to create a, um, uh, a region that is more peaceful, but also a region that is more secure and safe that you all want to point in, the, uh, in this uh, conf conference. Uh, I want also to take one some some examples here. For example, for example, your work on on on, on uh, connectivity or or uh, let's say even roaming or or safety and security in this case will definitely create uh, uh, better ways for communication among the youth in the region of Western Balkans, and by that giving more hope to youth even to to uh, consider consider uh, this this place as worth. To, to stay and see perspectives in the future. So the only way to, to tackle these issues or to boost the, the energy of youth is by us actually cooperating in the future and by us tackling all these issues uh, uh, seriously. I'm thinking on the issues of hate speech, radicalization, disinformation, as well as propaganda. From the side of RICO, last week we in fact made a, uh, we published a research, which we called, it, it is a joint, joint effort, effort with the UNDP and as well as uh, UNFPA. We called it Shared Futures, Youth Participation on Peace in Western Balkans. This study was conducted uh, uh, with 5,500 uh, youth from the region of Western Balkans in period from December, 2020 to January, 2021. And it was interesting uh, data. I mean, interesting data came, came from it. I hope you will have also a chance to, to, to see it. It is also published uh, online in our uh, web page from, uh, I, I think, from this week, in fact. Uh, among the main concerns of youth is actually the, the, the hate speech, be it online or uh, offline. And it is mostly reported as a uh, most reported actually type of uh, violence and discrimination with around 12% uh, of young people reporting it across the region of Western Balkans, which is a very high uh, no number in, in general. And it is maybe a little bit contradictory, but this um, the hate speech in a way, uh, the, actually the level of hate speech in a way in Western Balkans has uh, increased. Whereas we also see some, some uh, uh, data that gives us a little bit uh, hopes, let's say in Montenegro, the level of, uh, uh, I mean, as one of our co uh, contracting parties in, in Montenegro, the level of the 
hate speech has actually uh, has actually decreased, but in fact, it still remains as one of the uh, uh, contracting parties that uh, has uh, the highest uh, level of of uh, hate speech. This is also these uh, are also da data connected uh, to 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 fake news. So when it comes to my mind, uh, besides the cooperation and collaboration, as well as finding synergies between different uh, regional initiatives, such as the ones that are present uh, here, it's also uh, uh, the, 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 the fact that we need to focus a little bit more our activities and uh, emphasize the topic as such, because we realize that in, in our work in, in RICO, the, the, the there are not really projects that tackle directly the issue of the radicalization or uh, hate speech, but indirectly working in peace as a peace, as I said uh, before, we are uh, contributing to creating these uh, channels on communication and, and by that uh, bridging this the gap of unknown and uh, eliminating fear among among uh, different uh, communities, but is this enough. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't. I personally think that it's not enough, and we should really emphasize in our projects in the future, in our uh, grants, even in our internal activities, this uh, type of to topics that you are raising. Uh, they deserve to be not just emphasized, but but um, also worked more uh, concretely. So the youth and uh, actually all stakeholders that work with with youth understand the importance of such a uh, topic and uh, tackle it from from different angles there is nothing wrong in, in being more explicit to uh, naming or mentioning the topics as such uh, hate speech radicalization is a uh, is uh, uh, going to be challenge of the future because as we are also uh, uh, trying to understand the, the online platforms youth are even far uh, better than than us, they are some some could actually misuse uh, these platforms for for uh, uh, creating uh, better ways even to to promote uh, things that we don't want. I'm thinking here about on uh, hate speech, uh, fake news, uh, propaganda, disinformation, and uh, so on and so forth. So by that, we in RICO are committed to to really, as I said, uh, uh, open or work a little bit more on project applications, work on or a little bit more on, on uh, highlighting these topics in our guidelines for future projects, but also uh, tackle it more programmatically and seriously, especially now in a period uh, which I already mentioned that uh, we are working on, on, on working on strategy paper. So we want this topic to also tackle it uh, more explicitly in a programmatic way with a, with a more long-term and institutional support for such kind of uh, initiatives that, that deserve really a little bit more attention from the co-regions. That's why I'm, I'm that's why I'm really happy that that uh, you have raised this topic in your research. I, I see it really as a valuable um, in, input for all of us that work in the same field. I have a lot of takeovers from this uh, uh, from this that you that you did, and and one of them is connected to to the hope that you already gave me with the numbers of uh, percentages of of people not willing actually to use uh, arms. This for me shows that uh, the 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 region. Uh, of Western Balkans is fed up from uh, violence and arms, and, and uh, uh, at least we, we start not to see a point in this uh, di direction. That's why we really, I think, uh, we need to use this opportunity uh, and see these uh, figures as, as uh, hope, and by that create even better region, not just for the uh, uh, for the youth, but better region for for all people that want to create a safe and secure space where they can share and learn from each other uh, and create li literally a prosperous place which uh, will, will keep us all here. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanin. Thank you for sharing with us the excellent work RICO is doing with the youth in the region, but also uh, with these uh, topics that we are discussing here, to here today, the online uh, youth radicalization and uh, hate speech. Also very glad to hear that uh, uh, the findings of the security matter will be um, helpful in your, in your uh, daily work. Uh, I would like now to turn to our next panelist, that is Dr. Asia Metodieva. 
Uh, Dr. Methodievia is a researcher at the Institute of International Relations in Prague. She holds a PhD degree from Central European University. Uh, her research focuses on terrorism, mobilization into radical movements, polarization, and information warfare. Uh, dear Asia, thank you for, for being here. Uh, in your recent publications on the process of radical activism and recruiting of young fighters from the region, especially from post-conflict societies, you mentioned that recruiters make use of state weaknesses. You write, and I'm quoting, radical influencers filling the void left by domestic wars with life guidance and religious values. Can you please share with us how has the pandemic lockdown influence this process? What kind of digital tools and platforms uh, are radical influencers using to recruit youth? Thank you for, for this invitation. I'm really excited to, to join this panel and to be part of this discussion. I believe that there will be a lot of valuable uh, comments and arguments uh, to, uh, to, build, to build on. Um, so let me start one uh, step before the pandemic, because I think when we talk about uh, foreign fighters and radicalization, one, what the, the Balkans uh, experienced in the past five, six years uh, has changed enormously in the, with, with, with the pandemic. So in 2015, 2014, 2015, it was possible for people to travel freely to a war zone to join uh, radical and extremist groups, to post a selfie or a video on uh, major social media platforms such as Facebook or, or Twitter. This was possible five years ago. The progress that has been made is that um, platforms uh, like this, they, they have taken measures to improve uh, the, the filters or let's say the the um, uh, restrictions uh, for users to, uh, to post this content. This is one step towards progress. However, what we have witnessed is that there is a migration from one platform to another, not only when it comes to, as I call them, or using the social media term influencers, radical influencers, the migration is... Uh, with together with their followers to smaller platforms like Telegram or platforms which remain uh, not accessible uh, for the, the wider audience. This process has begun um, in the past four or five years, and I would say that this started before the pandemic. The reason for this migration process uh, was uh, exactly because there was a stronger response from security authorities locally and internationally. There was a stronger interest. What, what is this Islamic State? What is going on in Syria? Why all these people who um, socialize either in person or through social media ended up being in a war zone? Due to this interest and this, uh, uh, this uh, I would say, security environment, we have experienced a change, a dramatic change in the behavior of, of these actors. The second thing that I believe started before the pandemic is a process of moderation. People who used to, um, let's say, rely on more um, radical or extremist rhetoric, they decided, they took a strategic decision to become more silent, to become more moderate in their messages. Um, of course, not to post or share violent content explicitly, but to be, uh, to, to be more moderate uh, towards uh, their audiences and the way how they frame um, their understanding of reality. Um, what hasn't changed, though, is that these actors continue to engage with political uh, events, with uh, political situations, which have given them the opportunity to build on this narrative of, um, for instance, Muslim victimization, to create this uh, proxy humiliation response uh, in order to, to tell their audiences, look, this is happening in this part of the world and we should be sympathetic and we should engage politically 
or we, we should have an opinion on this. So this process has continued, I would say, in a very, very uh, moderate form compared to the, the moment of recruitment in 2013, 14, 15, these years. Um, the, the so-called radical influencers with the beginning of the pandemic uh, also had to make a new strategic choice. And I think that this is not valid only for terrorists or extremists or all, uh, all people who are part of these circles, but, but for all of us. The way we communicate has changed since the beginning of 2020. So before this, the argument in the literature was that hey, uh, no matter what's going on on Facebook, uh, we need in-person social communication, social interaction with one or another uh, leadership or, or influential figure in order to call this process um, radicalization and to see uh, this, this, uh, this process as a relational process in, in social networks. Whereas since 2020, we, we see that everything which used to happen in person had to shift to towards uh, the online space. And in this sense, I think that we don't observe anything different, like dramatically different from what was happening around, let's say, um, radical hubs or, or some sort of uh, uh, social conjugations or, or, or mosques or all these uh, spots for, for uh, uh, social activities which were present, more visible before. Uh, now this is this is happening online, but it's not more different. The question is how we respond to this. Uh, as I said, it is very hard to tackle to address this problem now because actors have become more moderate. Those who remain uh, more radical in the way they express themselves are in a very very marginalized circles. They don't they don't uh, seek to uh, expose a larger audience to, to their messages. However, if we look at the, uh, the jihadi Salafi movement in a, in a, in a more, more broader sense, I would say that there is, there is a strategic shift. If, if uh, the, the reason for them before was, uh, or to the main goal to um, recruit more people around the agenda of uh, having militants participating in Syria or having some sort of like, violent engagement now the goal is more to uh to have consolidation to have some sort of uh larger audience but to have this larger audience they had to moderate to make mo more moderate their their messages so i would say that we can talk about core and periphery of the audience of these recruitment circles in the periphery, it's, uh, it's about the, the speakers or the, the radical influencers who seek to, to uh, engage more people or to broaden their, their, their audiences. And in the core, these are the smaller groups, uh, groups which remain more committed to, to, to violent activities and rhetoric, uh, but their shift uh, towards smaller social media platforms uh, has become a very, very clear in the recent years. So as, as I mentioned, it's important how we respond. And when I say we, it's about each of us, not only, not only about uh, international organizations or, or local uh, security authorities, but I think that we all have problems with identifying disinformation. Uh, as Mr. Hani said that uh, maybe the younger generation is better equipped in this sense. And I think that the pandemic and all, all the the, the, the disinformation flow has proven this uh, uh, right. But the, the question is, uh, are we able to educate large, young audiences online to report, to become better in reporting when they witness some sort of hate speech or some sort of radical and violent rhetoric? Because at the end of the day, we have, on the one side, the social media platforms trying to address the issue to a certain extent. We have um, very slow international uh, institutions, including the European Union and, and local security authorities, not always having the capacity to de develop these tools. But the question is, are we able to, to, uh, to build communities in which everybody is able to say, look, this is wrong, I should report this. 
either to, to the social media platforms or some sort of like NGOs uh, engaged in, in this process. Uh, and this is not only related to, to the radical rhetoric, but on a more broader scale to disinformation, which is a very serious problem in the Balkans and more generally in uh, Southeastern Europe. Uh, I, I recently came across an article uh, that actually social media platforms don't have um, sufficient number of people uh, observe, uh, monitoring uh, hate speech in the Western Balkans, and more specifically, they don't have people sp speaking the languages to help them with with this uh, with this uh, filtering and this monitoring. And I think that this uh, this is a very serious problem. But to address this problem from the point of view of uh, radical socialization and violent rhetoric, we should think more of how we we engage young communities to, to, to report cases of, 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 uh, of violence and, and hate speech online. Thank you very much, dear Razia. Thank you for this overview. And thank you also for pointing out the need for educating our youth to report, uh, to properly report this uh, recruitment activities taking uh, place on uh, social media. Thank you. Uh, I would like now to, to turn to our next panelist, Dr. Charlie Winter. Dr. Winter is a senior research fellow at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization and a research coordinator for the Global Network on Extremism and Technology. He is also co-founder of the Conflict Analy Analytic uh, System, Extract. His work focuses on how and why violent extremists are using strategic communication to further their political and military agenda in both online and offline spaces. Uh, Dr. Winter, thank you very much for being uh, with us here today. What I would like to ask you is, uh, we know now that artificial intelligence can play an important role in the fight against terrorism and uh, violent radicalization uh, in prevention, uh, analysis and combat of these uh, issues. Would you please share with us some insight of the innovative uh, artificial intelligence tools that you have been specializing on, such as the extract? Uh, can you please share with us how do this work and how can they support practitioners working with the youth in the field? Of course. So, um, uh, first of all, can you hear me okay? Um, if yes. I don't, okay, great. Um, so, thank you, uh, first of all. Uh, of all for inviting me to, to to talk today it's been a really interesting couple of hours so far so it's um great to be able to participate in this um the the question of where artificial intelligence ai um is is appropriate for use in counterterrorism and countering violent extremism um programming is is a really important one it's it's often seen i think as a uh, a way to um quite dramatically speed up the process by which individuals who are problematic um, or may present security risks can be identified. Um, but I think that that's actually quite a um, uh, potentially damaging way of thinking about artificial intelligence. I, I personally don't like to think of it as a way to um, uh, mitigate risk, but more as a way to operate further upstream in the counterterrorism equation um, and uh, better understand the parameters of uh, terrorist discourse, as well as communication and outreach that's happening um, in online um, online theatres. It also can be used um, to better understand conflict data, uh, security data, incidents, SIGACT is a, a, another a way to refer to it, um, that is being produced by these organisations like Daesh, ISIS um, and, and Al-Qaeda. Um, and through harmonising that, uh, that material, that reporting, with uh, other forms of data, for example, on, uh, on social and economic and political trends, it may be possible to better triangulate and ultimately develop a way to, um, to, to be able to get out ahead of, of, of particular um, attacks or the, the opening of new fronts or campaigns and so on. Um, but you asked me specifically about Extract, um, which is a, uh, a conflict analytics system that I've been working on for the last couple of years with some colleagues at the Global Strategy Network, um, TGSN, which was set up a few years ago by a former intelligence um, director in the, the UK. So Extract uh, is essentially a, an online platform that uh, ingests all of the 
uh, official communications being published by the likes of Daesh and uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, and it maps all of that content, all of those uh, reports. And I'm talking about 20 or 30 individual claims of attacks being uh, published each day. It maps that out into um, a, uh, a variety of different um, visualizations. First of all, we have maps of where the attacks themselves are happening, uh, as well as um, uh, strategic and tactical trend analyses. Now, where Extract really comes into its own is it enables us to really have a very, very clear sense of uh, what the priorities are of a group like ISIS at any one point in time um, and in any geography where it claims to be active and present. So if you look specifically at um, the, the conflict trends in Syria or in uh, northeast Nigeria, you can immediately discern that there are different priorities, different modes of operation, uh, different objectives at play. Um, and that means that any uh, counter uh, ISIS programming can be better calibrated and more uh, nuanced in, in the approach that it is taking. Um, when we uh, think about more kind of domestic uh, counterterrorism and combating CV, uh, combating violent extremism efforts, um, the communications tracking aspect of, of, of X-Track um, really comes into its own. And that's where um, the AI portion of the system is, is most important. So essentially by processing uh, and, it, well, ingesting first of all, and then processing and disaggregating the thematic priorities, the tactical priorities of all of the propaganda that's being published by um, a group like ISIS and its supporters or Al Qaeda and its supporters. It's possible to, again, have that rolling strategic analysis in real time that enables us to flag where um, particular, particular problem areas might be or particular thematic issues. Um, that, that need uh, attention, um, or in, indeed, if we were to uh, focus on particular languages, um, particular nationalities or, or uh, regions of states that may be at particular risk of, um, of ISIS agitation, for example. Um, but the thing that, that I really want to emphasize is that artificial intelligence on its own is, is uh, good only up to a point. Um, it can be very, very effective if used in the right context in relation to the right data, and if it's been trained in the, 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 the correct manner. So AI needs a, a, a lot of um, uh, human intervention at the initial stages of developing any sort of model or algorithm um, that needs to essentially um, transplant the subject matter expertise, the relevant subject matter expertise, the way to interpret particular linguistic subsets, the way to interpret particular content um, in order for the, the resultant model or algorithm to, to make sense and, and yield results further down the line. If that's not done, then we're left with false positives, uh, false negatives, um, a lot of content that may be overlooked, um, a lot of content that may be um, prioritized incorrectly. So it's really, really important that when we do look to uh, further digitize or, or further make use of digital tools um, in our efforts to counter terrorism um, in the UK uh, and Europe as a whole, um, as well as uh, counter um, the ISIS or AQ insurgency further afield in their immediate spheres of operation, it's really important to recognize that it's no um, uh, all in one solution. It doesn't present that kind of um, immediacy. But what it can do is help us augment the capabilities that we have at present and better uh, understand and therefore approach the, the, the problem that as it manifests, whether that's uh, domestically or further afield in a more kind of military setting. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Winter. It was really, really interesting to learn how the uh, artificial intelligence can help uh, in the fight against terrorism and violent uh, radicalization. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, panelist is Ms. Fationa Medini. Ms. Medini has a bachelor's degree in journalism and a master's degree in public administration. After a long career as a journalist for national media in, Albi in, in Albania, she was awarded with uh, a Hubert Humphrey Scholarship in DC. From 2015, she reports stories from the Balkans for several media outlets like Balkan Inside, Al Jazeera in English, BBC, and uh, other. She also has co-established the Investigative Journalism Lab, an initiative to develop quality journalism for Albanian young journalists. Ms. Medini, thank you for, for being uh, with us today. 
uh, based on the findings of your research on Balkan extremism, what are the main factors that make young people in the region choose extreme paths? Would you please share with us some of your observations also on the risk of radicalization for children who are still in the Syrian camps? And maybe a few remarks or observation on what the respective governments, but also other actors can uh, do to prevent and combat youth uh, extremism from the region and in the region. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Yorida and RCC for the invitation to speak in this panel and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so for many years, I have, I have been covering in my capacity as a journalist the topic of religious extremism in the Western Balkans. And I could say that is really very difficult to pinpoint the main factor that pushes young people toward extremism in this region. This is because reasons are different based on these young people's social, economical, and educational status and opportunities, as well as countries and regions that they live in. However, based on my observation and also research, I would say that very often young people who joined extremist groups have been struggled for a long time to find a place of belonging and self-worth in their communities. Often they come from vulnerable or marginalized social groups, economical difficulties, lack of quality educations, and regions forgotten by state institutions. Religious and ethnic minorities are often the most vulnerable ones. Now I'm going to mention some of the factors that I believe push them toward extremist ideology and as a result, extreme paths. It's worth noting that unemployment of youngsters in the region is staggering and very little has been done to address this problem. Unemployment and lack of prospects leave them hopeless with many opting to leave and seek better opportunities in bigger cities or abroad. Those who stay uh, are often very discouraged and feel left behind. Furthermore, in many places throughout the region and especially in rural areas, the school system is weak when it comes to the quality of education that provides. On the other hand, often the school institution itself has failed to be a place where children and young people feel safe and have real chances to thrive. One aspect that I want to emphasize and I have personally witnessed uh, throughout the region is a lack of social, cultural and sport activities for young people, especially those in small towns and rural areas. In many parts of the Western Balkans, youngsters have really limited options when it comes to after school act activities, for example. Lack of infrastructures make the situation even worse. On the other hand, there is also in play the individual factor. Some of these young people who embrace extremist ideologies often go through personal and family traumas uh, and are in constant search of filling the void and revenge often on the society. All these factors make especially young people vulnerable and easy praise for radicals and extremist ideas. They create space for extremists to brainwash them online, but also offline, recruit and use them for their personal, political and distorted religious agendas. Uh, mentioning these facts, uh, it become clear that the state institution could, and in fact have the responsibility to play an important role in reducing these vulnerabilities and create a resilience among young people. It's important for the Western Balkans government to put the employment of young people high in their agendas through investments, innovation, and the creation of business enterprises. The increase in the level of education is also of high importance, as well as the need of school to be seen as the center of the community life. Programs should also be designed within the schools in order to help, help youngsters also deal with psychological issues and traumas that they must carry, might carry. On the other hand, investments in enhancing the social, cultural, and sport life uh, and youth engagements in them is a necessity. 
Well, many countries in the Western Balkans are multi-ethnic. It's important for state institutions to be inclusive and offer their citizens high quality services, no matter what their ethnicity or religion is. Of course, the government could not really do everything on their own. And for this reason, it's important that engagement of civil society organization as well. CSOs could play a big role in offering not only training, but also services. They could build vibrant youth centers, for example, engage youngsters in art and sport competitions and try to interact and work with them as much as possible. However, the real key to success lies in the good coordination of different initiatives and the creation of the referential mechanism that could aim to prevent rather than respond to extremism among you. Also, I want to address replying as well to your question, the issue of children from the Balkans that have been stuck for more than two years in the Syrian camps. In the latest piece uh, that I have written together with colleagues journalists for, of Bern, we, am, we estimate that there are around 150 children from the Western Balkans in these camps living in a very dangerous environment. Bosnia and Herzegovina have the largest number, around 70 of them, followed by Albania with around 40 children. Besides Kosovo, none of the Western Balkan uh, governments has shown a real commitment to bring these children back. While irresponsible parents have dragged them into a war and stolen their childhood, Governments of the Balkans are stealing their future when refusing to undertake whatever it takes and bring these children back home. It's important uh, that the repatriation of children of the Balkans is not, uh, is not only to be seen as a human, humanitarian issue, but it is as well an issue of national security. Very soon, these children are going to be adults and chances of a sex successful radicalization will significantly decrease. In this regard, they always will, will remain a security threat for their countries of origin. So this is a major alarm bell, and I hope governments of the Western Balkans will listen to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fationa, and thank you for pointing also out the challenges and the risk of the radicalization of our children who are still in the camps, an issue that uh, will grow more serious and have a long-term impact if not uh, properly addressed, as you said, by the governments, but also from other actors. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Ms. Sheila Brady. Uh, Ms. Brady has a 20 years experience and she has worked for many international organizations in the security arena, holding positions such as mission security analyst with European Union border assistance mission in Libya, senior security information analyst uh, in Nigeria and analyst with the European Union police mission in Bosnia and Herzegovina. She's also currently undertaking a PhD at Dublin City University. Uh, dear Sheila, you are among the researchers who have shared that in order to understand radicalization, we must grasp what is going on on the mind of the people who choose this path. In the past, you have also interviewed people convicted of terrorism. I would like to ask you to share some of the gaps that you have identified in social and educational institutions. Could you comment on this within the COVID-19 context where we know that almost everything has, uh, has shifted to, to online uh, settings. Would you please share with us some of your observations? Thank you very much and thank you for the invite and congratulations on the launch of the security meter. Um, I've already been looking at it with keen interest, so congrats. Um, so I suppose Ashia spoke um, about COVID, so I won't kind of overly repeat it, but I think from a simplistic point of view, it's always important to look at what we know from other types of crime and opportunity increases certain types of crime. So the opportunity that COVID has given us by everybody moving their social, their professional and you know, even sporting activities online has produced an opportunity. We can't deny that. 
for extremists, but it's also provided an opportunity for interaction and engagement with other per people, whether that's state, NGOs or anybody else. So I think we have to be balanced in how we look at it. One challenge I always see in this area is in relation to how we look at extremists and especially online extremism, but how we look at the people involved. And we always see, often see them as different to ourselves and to others. And in many ways, this creates a problem for us and also empowers them. And what I mean by us in that context, I mean whether we're um, normal citizens that have answered your questionnaire or whether we're the state. So research, the literature of people like Paul Gill, John Horgan have shown that the extremists and terrorists are no different psychologically from us, from normal, from us, we we'll say non-extremist people. And my research interviewing um, extremists, uh, both that had come back from Iraq and Syria, um, and also some right-wing groups, um, and also organized criminals, much of whom I interviewed actually within the Western Balkans, has shown to me how normal these people are. And I know that can be really unpalatable, but I also in my PhD, which I'll talk about um, shortly, but also I'm finding that with, in relation to their online content and the motivations that they have online for engagement, for diversion, for uh, extremist or nefarious acts, for interest, you know, we all go online for similar reasons. And as I say, that's in the literature. And why is that important in the context of your question about institutions and the gap that I've foreseen? As it, because if we treat people differently as this elusive group, many times the people then we ask to respond to it, especially if they're not within the security framework, feel disempowered or not confident to respond. And I noticed that particularly in the prisons, in the schools, probation services, community support, that if we frame extremism within the context of pure security and risk, we're actually disempowering the many people that have the skill sets, the experience and the capacities to deal with vulnerable people, to deal with marginalized people. And we saw in the, if I got it correctly, in the security barometer, that things like economic crisis, poverty, social exclusion are real concerns. They're the things that social workers, community workers, schools uh, have been identifying in children for years. And by framing something purely within the security uh, environment has often disempowered them. They don't feel adequate. They're afraid that they might, you know, enhance or uh, further the problem or stigmatize youth. So what I would be calling for is to re-empower these people to do what they do and do well. And yes, that might need funding and additional training, but actually to empower them that they do and have been identifying risk factors far before they become to this problematic, problematic behavior. And if I pick up on my PhD uh, research where I'm looking at um, extremists online content and their strategies, but I'm not looking at it just purely from one type of extremism. I've looked at global groups, right wing, left wing, religious, non-religious, um, all across the world, but I've compared them with people like the military, private military contractors or mercenaries, and I'm sure seeing a normalcy or a sameness in how that they're actually attracting the youth and uh, potential recruits to their cause. So what I'm saying is, again, once we see this kind of regular routine, this should empower the people that have these skill sets in the non-security framework to feel that they can empower and play a role in this. So and what I'm seeing in that is it's not all about misinformation and disinformation, even though that's there, but they actually use, and I think it was as she was saying, they've got much more strategic in how they do this. They're using actually skills of persuasion and influence similar to that used in advertising. So they have truths and falsehoods. They, have, they challenge people and then they reassure. They evoke positive emotions and quickly negative emotions. These are really dynamic videos. But actually what the important point is these four groups, illicit, quasi-illicit and legal, i.e. the military, are using similar uh, factors to attract people. And in that, I think, actually gives us a real important opportunity to engage because we actually can have the conversation with advertising, you know, a, a industry for years that know actually how they influence people. 
And I think this goes back to this 26% of respondents, if I'm correct, said uh, they didn't feel there was sufficient ways of how to control online radicalization. And I think their fear can be in language, but if we bring it back to language that they're more comfortable with, i.e. advertising, why don't we all buy a can of Coke when we see an a, a ad about it? Because we actually have built up resilience to it and kind of taking the point of this panel about resilience, I think it's really important not only to look at resilience in the people that might be affected by extremism, but also the people that actually should be and could be responding more effectively to it. And my last point, I think, is something that I didn't hear much of today. And I wouldn't, if that's the only takeaway that people get from my piece, and I'm happy to talk about the persuasion more in the questions and answers, but I'm conscious of time. But it's the need to evaluate these things that are happening out there, the good and the bad. So we need to see what's working, what's not working, but more concretely to that, where it's working, why it's working, how it's working, how much it's costing to work. And then to evaluate that, build in evaluation from the design of the project midway, tweak, and actually afterwards, and feed that back in more of an analytical process. And I think that's fundamentally important because, yes, it's important for governments to work together regionally, internationally, but also we need to find these local ideas that are working. We can't fix extremism. There's no one fixed solution to it. It's context specific, it's very local level, and we break it into smaller bites, we can actually be effective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Sheila. I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, our next panelist is Mr. Simon Dukic. Uh, Mr. Dukic is a manager for the Balkans and Central Asia at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. He leads the Institute's programmatic and research efforts in the two regions, which are currently mostly under the umbrella of the Strong Cities Network and Young Cities. His work focuses on supporting national and local government stakeholders in strengthening national local coordination and sharing best practices around creating resilient communities. Uh, dear Mr. Dukic, in your 2020 report on the propagation of extremism ideology through online platforms, you mentioned that extremist propaganda in the region exploits and draws on regional narratives. Based on your findings, what can be done by the governments, the private sector, civil society organizations as well to mitigate the impact of polarizing and hateful contact in the region? And maybe uh, we, maybe you can also share with us uh, uh, some concrete initiatives that you are currently implementing with young people on online harms in the region and what has been its impact so far. Thank you very much, Eurita, for your question and the invitation to join this very prestigious panel. Uh, and also congratulations on the successful delivery of the Western Balkan Security Barometer, which is very amazing and very useful as a useful achievement for informing policy uh, and activities uh, in the region. Here at the Institute of Strategic Dialogues, we're also focusing very much on public perceptions around community resilience, and we've seen them as very important in terms of how we you know, establish strategy, but also implement it concretely on the ground. When it comes to online extremism, I'll start immediately by stating that the threat of online radicalization or more broadly online harms is, is in, uh, intrinsically cannot be seen as only, you know, through a country specific response, but needs to have a regional approach. Uh, why? Because the internet, the, because the internet is free for use. Um, it's very, uh, it's unmoderated and the content that's shared there is, um, you know, in real time. And the only barrier for access is somebody being proficient in the language in which the content is shared. This means that, for example, if we have Albanian content, that all speakers that understand and are proficient in Albanian throughout the region can read it. Also, similarly, Serbo-Croatian content can be understood by speaker of Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, Montenegrin, and even Macedonian, um, and can be shared easily throughout the region in real time. Uh, it is also important to know that we cannot exclude diaspora communities who have also been very engaged in extremist and hateful content and have contributed to it uh, as well, whether it's in the local languages or whether it's, you know, in English, in German and so on and so forth. Uh, in my presentation, I'll, I'll bring forward six, six concrete points or six recommendations that I'll go through and I'll build on through some of the uh, content and points that my fellow panelists have shared. First, build our understanding 
it's very important to build our understanding of the dynamic threat landscape. Uh, Asia, I believe, mentioned that the current environment is very different from what the environment was, you know, two, three years ago, and it's very different to what it was five, six years ago, and so on. Uh, depending on what our responses are, extremist groups are also, you know, moving forward and seeking new venues through which to distribute, uh, distribute uh, their propaganda, messaging, and content as well. So, for example, if they get shut down on one platform, they will merge on a different platform. They'll become they'll become using more moderated uh, language, just not to be blocked because of their freedom of expression and so on, expression and so on and so forth. Um, there are some gaps. In this, you can still find some um, extremist materials online. Uh, when it comes to particularly Salafi Jihadi groups, for example, uh, I was just recently browsing uh, Twitter, for example, and yesterday I saw a couple of content from a Salafi Jihadi militant group called Jam Jamati Alban, which has content and material on Twitter easily available for any one of us to basically log in and check right now. Um, secondly, this is not just confined to Salafi Jihadi groups, it's also among right-wing groups. They are also have also moved to Telegram groups, which are encrypted and much more difficult to easily go through. But they're using the internet in different means in terms of raising funds for their activities and so on and so forth. Um, but it's, we shouldn't just focus on established violent extremist groups. We also need to look at crowdsourced hate that exists uh, and manifest itself spontaneously uh, online. So this is something that, you know, it's not propagated, you know, from one group down, but it's something that people see in mainstream uh, individually. And this is something that we cannot analyze um, manually. Even if we get, you know, 100 analysts per country to go manually through um, hateful content or hate speech, it still won't be enough. And this is where uh, uh, Dr. Winter's presentation is very important in terms of artifi uh, artificial intelligence and natural language processing um, software to be able to understand uh, what sort of hate exists. Here at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, we're currently working on this type of research using natural language processing tools in uh, North Macedonia. Uh, and we've seen that there are a lot of hateful content that is not religious uh, based, for example, that is mainly around political issues, you know, involving migrants, refugees, which is something we've heard about today, but also the LGBT community, EU NATO integrations, and so on and so forth, which are, you know, key topics and key political issues around which hateful content is being uh, released. And we need this sort of software for us to be able to easily identify it. The second point is investment in regional expertise to address, uh, oh, pardon me, one thing that I've also mentioned is, uh, that I also forgot to mention is uh, the, 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 the awareness that people need to, to, or not just the awareness, that governments need to have about how big this problem is and how, how to best um, address it. Secondly, it's investing in regional expertise and addressing language uh, blind spots among tech companies particularly. Uh, I can, I think it's Yasia that mentioned at the end of her presentation that she read an article in terms of Facebook uh, that doesn't have uh, you know, local language consultants, experts and so on on their teams. Um, this is partly true because they do employ consultants and not you know, current staff or experts that understand the intrinsicness behind extremist groups and extremist narratives uh, in the region. So there definitely needs to be uh, more capacity building around tech companies. Um, particularly the ones that are, you know, more present and are, have more penetration among society, uh, because we know from the bigger ones, none of them have any presence in the Balkans. They don't have any offices at all, which also makes cooperation between governments and the companies much more difficult. Um, also, some platforms are not even aware about the risks that exist over here. For example, you know, platforms that share music because there's a lot of extremist music that's being spread around through Spotify, through SoundCloud, so on and so forth, whether it's Salafi Jihadi or right-wing extremists. And also gaming platforms, which are very important and a very important venue uh, through which extremist narratives are also being spread. So awareness needs to be raised among those to uh, match the duty of care that they need to, to provide for all of their customers and make sure that extremism is not being spread. The, my third point is around uh, moving beyond content moderation. So it's not just about censoring and making sure that you know we we refer to content, but it's also making sure that we or tech companies basically improve their uh, algorithms. Uh, anybody that has used Facebook, Instagram, um, YouTube, for example, here would notice that you know in your section, probably on the right or somewhere below, you will have recommended uh, material. 
uh, there was a report, an internal report at Facebook that um, around 64% of individuals that were uh, following extremist groups followed them based on recommended material that they've seen directly on their profiles. So this is something that needs to be done better and improve the algorithms in order to make sure that, you know, once you, 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 you get exposed to this material, that you don't go into the rabbit hole and sink into more and more extremist narratives. Four, develop uh, regional response to regional challenge. I mean, events like these are very important in terms of raising awareness in terms of that this is a regional issue that this needs to be done, uh, you know, jointly by governments, but also civil society organizations and the private sector. Um, and, you know, in terms of practicalities, it's easy to establish regional task force that will have, you know, concrete activities that will be funded to devise strategies, but also um, talk about what the threats are and how they are mutual between the, the, you know, on a bilateral level, on a multilateral level, oops, sorry, um, alarm went off, um, and um, making sure that this is a topic that is, you know, not just discussed once, but there is a continuation in terms of um, uh, modes of operations, lines of effort, and so on. Uh, so, for example, the, IA, the IISG uh, meetings, the biannual ones with the national coordinators, sorry, again, um, can be used as, you know, events where on the margins of the event in, in, uh, issues like these can be discussed. Strengthen partnerships, my fifth point, strengthen partnerships with broader civil society and local communities. This is something that has been shared around. But again, it's very important for the civil society organizations to have a bigger say in this and local communities because they know best know the local grievances and because trust rates or public trust among governments is low in the Western Balkans, so they might not be the most credible uh, actors and the resident voices when it comes to um, promoting counter uh, narratives or alternative narratives. And finally, six point, which is one of my, I, I think the most important point is promoting digital citizenship skills through civic education. Um, a report that I read uh, recently from the, apologies, uh, from the uh, media, uh, from the Open Society Institute on Media Literacy Index, the Western Balkans is the, or citizens from the Western Balkans are the most vulnerable when it comes to um, uh, online content and media literacy and resilience to this literacy. So henceforth, we need to have more robust civic education programs, but not just for youth, but also for uh, older generations um, uh, within the Balkans. Uh, and this uh, means, you know, uh, understanding this information, the spread of this information, um, so on and so forth, and not just through the formal educational sector, but also having informal educational opportunities as well. Um, one of the things that we're working on, and this I'll be very brief, I know I've extended, I, I went over my time, uh, but through the Young Cities program that we have currently in North Macedonia in the municipalities of Chair and um, uh, Gostivar, we have been working with youth groups to strengthen their resilience, but also work with them on uh, local initiatives that they're leading and we're funding to basically get their, enhance their experience in project implementation, but also make sure that they're are um, actors that are involved in their communities, they have a voice and they uh, try to express their grievances, but also provide solutions to their grievances in a way uh, that is uh, fostering social cohesion, but is also um, uh, uh, raising the resilience of communities. So we've had uh, currently, are currently running projects that I have to do with, you know, gender issues, women empowerment, uh, but also tackling, you know, uh, issues around brain drain, trust, in governments, but also making sure that youth uh, groups and individuals are heard when it comes to policy making. Um, that's it for my presentations. If there are any questions or comments afterwards, I'll be very happy to answer it again. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Simon, for this comprehensive overview and the very valuable suggestions. Uh, last, but of course, definitely not least, we have Mr. Werner Princiakovic. Mr. Princiakovic is an act active in professional youth work since 1984. From 2008, he is the educational director of Association of Unis Youth Centers. Apart from supervising the units, he is encouraging specific activities in political education, integration, and diversity and international relations. He is acting trainer in conflict management, youth participation, participative methodology, and intercultural learning. Mr. Princiakovic, given your very wide experience in grassroots projects with your local work in Austria, the IRN Praxis Exchange, 
Could you please share with us some good practices that could be transferable also to the Southeast uh, Europe region? And because we have not very much time, I would like to also ask the second question immediately, so you can please uh, take them both. Uh, you have been advocating for years for the role of non-formal education and youth work in early prevention. Now that traveling and meeting in person is almost impossible, how can practitioners work effectively with young people? How has this situation affected the quality of uh, non-formal education and what can be done? Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and considering the, the time limits, I try to be brief uh, and right jump into some conclusions from, from projects we did both on a local level here in Vienna uh, in terms of uh, online youth activities and also projects I, I got to know through the Radicalization Awareness Network of the European Union where I was working for a while. Uh, I would have five points first for activities online concerning young people. And I'm aware that specifically for, for the Balkans with quite limited uh, resources, specifically for civil society, because I'm coming from a civil society organization, uh, this is quite challenging. But one of the most important things from my point of view on the, on the work on this is continuity. Uh, you will never reach results and impact with a small scale project compared to continuous work with young people in general, but also specifically online. Like my organization here in Vienna, we are lucky having enough resources and our direct online activities with young people started 15 years ago. We did the first research in 2010 on, on working online with youngsters. Uh, so, because one thing is important, also both offline and online, is that you get into a relationship and into a, a relationship with trust with young people. And this can't happen in a short term, weeks or month long project. Uh, second point would be do it on a low threshold. We are already heard. Uh, if I remember right, from Ms. Medini, that the most vulnerable are those young people not that well educated and with lack of resources. That's exactly those youngsters we want to try to reach, both with our offline activities, running youth centers and doing street work, uh, sending uh, youth workers to the street and doing online work with them is basically very similar to that. Uh, so we're not trying to establish uh, our own platforms in the online world. We are rather using the platforms where the young people are. And that's, as we heard today already, that's changing a lot. Like 10, 15 years ago, it was totally different than it is now. For now, like, I'm sure that might not be that different concerning platforms also in the Western Balkans, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube are the preferred platforms for young people to use. Uh, and more and more important also for working with them online and specifically as we have just heard in, in the case of radicalization and extremism is everything that has to do with gaming. So it's Steam and Twitch, for example. Uh, and for one brief example I, I learned in, uh, in the radicalization awareness network is that like the Dutch police actually who are definitely not youth workers or social workers, they are offering uh, online gaming activities for young people to get in touch with them and also using one of, one of these platforms. Uh, that leads me to this, the next point because one of the most important thing in primary prevention where I come from is that with any activities, be it offline or online, you never start with extremism and radicalization as a topic. We need to start with those topics where young people actually are interested in. It could be gaming, it could be something totally different. But if you just slam into the door with, hey, let's do something about radicalization and extremism, then you have lost right from the start. Uh, one more point is, if you continuously work there, 
set up a code of conduct for your work, which would include be honest, tell them where you are. You're not police. You're not investigating something. You want to get into an authentic type of contact with young people. Uh, so you should be open with things you want to do with them. And actually what you want to do with them is you want to support them actually, not to get into the extremism and radicalization trap. And, and the last for the first bit, then I switch over immediately to, to, to the, to the uh, experiences during the pandemic. And this is kind of one of the important things for me, it's, it's never online on its own. So like any, any activity and any offering you do in the online world has to be combined with some online offering. Because this is something that leads me directly to, to the experience of the last year. Like we had to close all our venues immediately last March uh, and, and switch over to online contact almost only, in, in at least for a month. Uh, and luckily, as I said, in Vienna, we have this uh, for years already. So the contacts already were there. Like we have about 35 venues here and, and every youth center here already has some established uh, connections via the, the platforms I just mentioned to hundreds of youngsters. So the contact was there. For the first weeks in the pandemic, everyone was enthusiastic that there's at least something, but already after two months, the most important topic that came up in Instagram and in the communication with the young people was the question, when are you reopening? When can we meet you as a youth worker also uh, in person? And luckily, like after two or three months, at least to, within some several, certain regulations, this was possible. So, and only online, that was something we again learned in the pandemic and only online offer is not sustainable. Not, neither in terms of countering extremism and radicalization or any other topic. Uh, but still, we knew beforehand or with, uh, it was clear beforehand that that, uh, that was proved in, in this last year was that concerning non-formal education, the roles, the rules, uh, in the online work are not that different from, from the offline. What I've mentioned before, be authentic. If it's on extremist or radical contact, when it comes up and you approach this in an online way, don't start to judge immediately. I mean, in the code of contact, you need to have your red lines defined. How far? would you go? When, when, when is it in a situation that you even uh, think this is something that has to be reported to police or somewhere else? This has to be clear from the beginning. And there is a red line, of course. But still, if you want to establish this trust, and that's basically the same that people grooming online for extremist networks are doing, uh, you don't judge. You have to be interested in the person. I mean, if you're not interested in young people, you shouldn't do youth work anyway. So that's also quite the same in the online and the offline work. And of course, also in online communication, you're, you need to start with the interests of young people and you need to support the strengths of young people. So that's totally the same in online and offline work. And the last fact that it was quite interesting coming up in this last year, and and, think, and it was mentioned, I think, and uh, I think it was Albert right in the beginning, who said that already uh, that young people are better equipped already than the older generation, and that was something that came out also in the last year. I'm also in the board of the Austrian. Center for Counseling on Extremism. And two years ago, it was almost only parents, educators, teachers, social workers who called the hotline on extremism. And in most of the cases, it was about young people. Uh, they were calling and asking what to do. There was a very interesting development in the last year 
that now it's more than 25, almost 30% of the calls are young people calling the hotline for their parents. Because now uh, all the, the older generation is a lot more vulnerable as it seems to the conspiracy theories that came up with the, with the pandemic. And that was quite interesting development. We hadn't counted on that, but at least we think that's a proof of what Albert has said already that young people are better equipped also in dealing already with hate speech, at least in the, I mean, I'm coming from a Western European country. Uh, I cannot judge on similarities in the Balkan in this topic, but it proves also what has been said before that like also if it's formal or non-formal education system, it has to focus on this, and and that's the last point that the online, the offline activities, the education at school, if we are out of the pandemic, it's for sure more important than directly working online. So, just leaving online factors away is not the right way to go. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Princiakovic. Thank you for sharing with us your uh, long and great experience in working uh, directly with the youth. We have actually reached the end of our panel. Uh, my colleagues are confirming me that there are no questions and answers. Okay, so uh, thank you very much from my side, but uh, of course from, I, I'm sure I'm speaking also on, my, on behalf of my uh, colleagues. Thank you very much for your great contribution in uh, today's discussion. Uh, your observations and valuable experiences in how young people may be able to use the capacities of internet, including artificial intelligence, uh, can play an important role to better shape the actions of the governmental agencies, but also the civil society and media. And uh, I'm sure that they are, and they will be very useful for also for our uh, work in the future. Uh, but thank you all once again. I would like to, to give the floor to our dear colleague, Mary Drasopoulos, founder and president of Euro Balkan Forum, for the last conclusions of the panel. Dear Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Yuriva. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. So, greetings from Thessaloniki, and warm thanks to all the experts for their contributions. Now, I will try to sum up this very interesting input that we received today by presenting some of the key points and messages. Now, we all see that the launching event for the security meter came at a time of global efforts to identify, prevent, and combat security threats that have been further either accentuated or even transformed in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, feeling secure is a basic need we heard in the opening speeches. Now, in this sense, it is of paramount importance to raise awareness with events like this one, exchange accurate information, and facilitate the debate over issues sensitive, controversial, or even unpleasant. As one of our panelists said, we need to name the issues affecting us and tackle them explicitly with long-term institutional support. Reflecting now on all the useful input that we heard today, we understand the need to work together across sectors to make sure that the voice of citizens, as reflected in the security meter, will have a positive impact on the region. Solidarity, coordinated joint action in both preventing and handling security threats are among the main messages communicated by the vast majority of people. There is no security without collective security, as we read in the text. What we can do, however, to ensure that findings are transferred into policy so that citizens of the region can see concrete changes in their lives. I would like to take a step back and reflect on some shared viewpoints underpinning the words of our panelists. The first one is the need to see the region as a whole, just like the security meter does, and realize the importance of meaningful cooperation in providing effective solutions to challenges. The second one, is a triangle between the culture, tradition, and ideology. As we heard in the plenary, a change of policy requires a change in mentality. It has been discussed, for example, 
how youth radicalization is linked with society-related traumas and family or school-related parameters. We also talked about how the use or misuse of firearms is connected with culture and tradition. And this is also how the factor of gender also comes in the picture. A change in the way of doing things apparently requires also a shift of paradigm, to quote one of our speakers. In other words, we must employ innovation and synergies in order to make our region more attractive and prosperous, as was mentioned. So as to combat plagues such as brain drain among youth, the negative effects of which became even more evident with the outbreak of the pandemic. The third factor is fighting invisible enemies with the adequate tools. It has been understood via the security meter findings that people tend to feel safer in areas where they cannot see a direct negative effect on their daily realities. As for instance, in the case of transnational organized crime, this feeling of safety, however, can be misleading. On the contrary, our findings show that people tend to be more radical towards visible threats in brackets, as in the case of illegal migration, for instance, where threat has a human face and is seen walking in the streets. So what happens in the case of other threats that follow digital paths, which are much harder to trace? One of the key messages is that we cannot tackle new challenges such as invisible digital enemies with conventional tools. We need to come up with new strategic choices given that our communication patterns have also changed. Respondents have identified digital threats as aspects of a new type of digital war against which they often feel unprotected. As a response to this, our panelists today have stressed the importance of employing novel artificially intelligent tools in the management of digital threats, be it in the field of organized crime and border security to the prevention of online terrorist recruitment spread of fake news and propaganda. We must remember, however, that for these tools to be reliable and effective, they should be in the right context and should go together with adequate training, infrastructure, capacity building, and human intervention. Focusing now particularly on youth radicalization and terrorism in the virtual sphere, we have had very interesting facts and practices. I would like to isolate some key points as expressed by our speakers, which also verify and further consolidate security meta findings. Parameters such as lack of opportunities in the region, limited citizens' mobility, sense of political instability and ethnocentrism render young people more vulnerable to violent radicalization. Online radicalization and hate speech are ongoing digital menaces. At the same time, however, there is lack of awareness among the public on how to identify, prevent, and also report upon digital threats, such as disinformation, online extremist recruitment, and terrorist propaganda. Updated resources for practitioners working with youth are also limited, not to mention the shrinking space for civil society and the limited institutional support in long-term projects for youth. Furthermore, living in the margin of Europe and being deprived of privileges enjoyed by other European young people increases the social cultural gap between EU and Western Balkan six youth. We have mentioned today brilliant projects for the prevention of youth radicalization. Most of these projects, however, are reserved either for EU youth or for Western Balkan six youth only, minding also the traveling difficulties that exist in the region. Let us ask ourselves, how can we expect young people to understand each other's values when they're deprived of the opportunity to meet, work, study, and travel together? How can we demand of them to be open-minded and resilient when they are being raised in homogenous, closed cycle societies defined by strict cultural norms? Concluding, the pandemic has taught us that the importance of cooperation in times of humanitarian crisis is vital. Also, the value of human life over social political disputes. As one of our speakers said, no nation can tackle these lessons alone. All our panelists here today have agreed that now it is the right time for us to make good use of the hard lessons learned in order to handle security challenges together. 
there are no magical remedies as we heard in the panel. Fixing any problematic situation is a long-term process that requires commitment and continuation. It also requires the building of trust between citizens and institutions. Change will start from us, from our communities, from the way we choose to do things in the region and interact with each other. In this context, the security meter is much more than a research-based resource. It's a dynamic tool that can guide us in transferring findings into concrete policy recommendations for the overall good of the region. Thank you all for being here today and sharing with us your valuable knowledge and insights. Good luck with the proceedings. I cannot hear anything, but maybe I would like to give a floor back to, to Yorida to, to close the meeting or to one of uh, our RCC colleagues. A little confusion at the end. Uh, I'd like to thank you once again for your attendance, for your ideas. We will certainly continue working together in months and years to come. Thank you. Have a nice day. Stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye.